the Chantry teaches us. Dragon Age is one of the most beloved RPG series in video game history, flooded by 101 different critiques, reviews, retrospectives, and general analysis videos, but as you can probably tell by the length of this playlist, I wanted to do something different for my own project on the series. I've always found that most game critiques hold a special aura of nostalgic value for Dragon Age Origins against the sequels like they can't conceive of the idea that Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition are attempting to be something different from the original that started it all. Yet despite these wildly different gameplay approaches, they all coalesce into a single world narrative as the lore progressively grows with each and every game. So contrary to many people's beliefs, it's my very subjective opinion that Dragon Age Inquisition and Dragon Age 2 are both better games than Dragon Age Origins, although each addition to the series certainly has its own merits. And it's due to this hot take opinion of mine about the series that I felt it was necessary to do a deep dive into every single main entry in the series, along with their respective DLCs, in order to understand why I felt the way I do about these games. If you're looking for another layman's 10 minute long video review on the games, this certainly isn't the place for you, but if you have even a mild interest in the game lore, mechanics, stories, or setup for the up and coming Dragon Age 4, then my name is JB Jet and I want to take you on a journey through every single branch and turn you can explore in this Dragon Age series retrospective. Admittedly, I'm sure that many true fans of the series can attest to a more diverse breadth of experience with the games, since I've only beaten Origins twice, Dragon Age 2 three times, and Dragon Age Inquisition three times as well. Despite that, I feel as though I've experienced the vast majority of major gameplay paths since most of Dragon Age games end up devolving into a series of binary choices that end up branching off into the wildly different world states that the player can attain. See, even in the lofty heights of player choice that critics have made out of Dragon Age Origins, the vast majority of choices only have three real options, two of which are supposed to be morally grey and one that requires the player to follow a very specific path from the outlier option you might not even know exists. But even this is starting to get ahead of myself, so why don't we start at the beginning? Let's say you're one of the few people that have never played the Dragon Age series, or you tried a couple of times in the past and bounced off after a couple of hours for some reason. I'm happy to say that the games still end up feeling really good by modern standards. Some noticeable problems with camera control pop up across the series, but it's the type of problems that you can learn how to work around instead of getting crushed against the wall like the auto cameras in old 3D games. Similarly, the most obtrusive gameplay aspect that you'll have to deal with is the poor representation of stat and skill knowledge, and your resulting ability to make a strong enough character to tackle the endgame challenges. While this is a common problem amongst most RPG games that give you character development choices, it still means that players would be best served by doing just a little bit of research ahead of time in order to guarantee a smooth experience throughout the games. Despite this, the series is generally pretty flexible with character builds and have been proven to be beatable with weird party compositions like four rogues, warriors, or mages if you know what you're doing. It's for this very reason that the game's dependency on knowledge and experience for difficulty that it's very easy for a player that's struggling on normal their first playthrough but breeze through nightmare mode on their second playthrough due to all the lessons they learned on their first trip. This lent a hand in encouraging multiple playthroughs each game since most players find each trip will go faster and faster as they learn more about the hidden mechanics and unimportant busywork in each game that they can skip on the follow-ups. All of which made the multiple playthroughs I did for this it video much easier to accomplish than you would expect at first glance. Every game in the series has the capacity to be beaten within 30 hours for your average gamer, but they also hold the depth of gameplay to allow you to spend a hundred hours in each of these stories if that's how you wanted to play. And I think that's one of the greatest strengths of the Dragon Age series, that they're willing to put so much effort into great big chunks of content that they can't guarantee a player will ever even see. The most noticeable example of this across the series is the first experience most people had with Dragon Age as a whole. The origin system. By dividing players into a series of six different prologue situations, each scenario presents the player with a very starting view of the world as they decide to play as the Dwarf Commoner, Dwarf Noble, Human Noble, City Elf, Dalish Elf, and 
circle mage. And while they all result in wildly different starting experiences, the way they end up tying in together as you progress through Ostagar results in an almost identical long-term game flow despite the option between six different prologues. And while there are some different dialogue lines that can result from these choices, the only real effect might be a different character gets abducted later in the game, more as a cameo than a difference with any real substance. But this is also indicative of the importance of choices across the game as a whole, since they always seem to result in a neutral world state so that the writers have something to build off of for the later games. So while the noble human origin gives your main character the capability to become King of Ferelden, the net effects of this option become almost completely insignificant by the time 10 years have passed and the story of Inquisition starts. In fact, one of the most thematically important origins is the Dalish prologue where your character is introduced to the idea of these ancient magic mirrors which don't actually end up getting fully explored until near the end of Inquisition six hours later in the retrospective and probably around 100 hours of total gameplay after this point in the series. So if you haven't already noticed by this point, this retrospective will be full of spoilers for just about every main storyline in the series. So if you're the type of person who likes to play through games blind, then you might want to turn away now because there won't be another warning. The thing is, I've always seen the idea of spoilers to be a big mixed bag as far as player value since it does certainly eliminate the element of surprise for a player, but it also allows players to look at elements of a story with a deeper level of understanding than they might have been able to without prior knowledge. I guess that's my best attempt to justify the fact that I just want to talk about these games for a couple hours in order to give you a better sense of their value and perhaps inspire a couple of you to take one more pass through such an amazing series. With that in mind, I'm going to start by focusing on Origins because the series has a tendency to lean upon your cumulative knowledge as far as the game world goes. Each entry to the series could theoretically be taken as a standalone product with enough exposition about the races to develop a understanding without prior experience, but when taken as a linear path through the world, many of the story beats hit just a little bit harder in the later games when you have a better sense of context for what it might feel like living as say, a circle mage. See, your circle mage prologue option in Dragon Age Origins isn't very robust. It takes about an hour to complete at most, and includes a 10 minute long introduction to the Fade, your oh so typical spider cave sequence, and a short period where you fight against unexplained statue guardians in order to help another mage earn his freedom. And yet, Despite its brevity, this has been the only opportunity to experience life as a circle mage in the series as a whole. That one of the key conflicts in the entire Dragon Age series revolves around the oppression of mages in the circle towers, and our only opportunity to experience that problem firsthand is an hour long intro sequence to the game. It's just odd. So, is that what people like about the origin system, that it allows players to get a deeper understanding of what it means to be a member of your race? The problem with this is that the vast majority of players never put in the effort to play more than one or two origin stories, and if we base this conclusion off of the achievement stats for each origin, only a maximum of 25% of players have played all six stories. In reality, it's much more likely that only around 10-15% to of players have taken this route and explored all the prologues, which brings into question their importance in the grand scheme of things. Like with most choices that result in player different experiences, at a certain point they all had to homogenize a bunch of the stories so that the main plot could function no matter which choice you made. By starting as a city elf, you get to see the racial politics that led a noble to disrupt an elven wedding and eventually led to riots in the elven quarter. But if you had chosen any other prologue option, these events still happen and affect the game despite the fact that you weren't the one watching them transpire. So as an exposition tool for introducing the difference between a city elf and a dalish elf, it's an amazing option for role players. But for the context of actually teaching the player about the different races of Thetis, it feels since most players won't end up seeing the vast majority of options. It's after this point where all the separate origins end up leading to a single plot event, and your main character is charged with becoming a Grey Warden. The origin stories unanimously accomplish this by backing your player into a corner where they would either be imprisoned, killed, exiled, 
or as it so happens are forced to conscript into the Grey Wardens, since a recruiter named Duncan happens to be in the area when your world starts burning down around you. I actually think that this is a wonderful implementation of a mentor character since Duncan always manages to be introduced as a voice of reason, willing to save you from whatever problem your origin has thrown you into. This savior mentality immediately establishes a reason for most people to like Duncan, which the game only expands upon when he takes the role of a master-apprentice relationship with you in order to teach you what it means to be a warden. The Grey Wardens are in fact a group of warriors specifically trained in how to fight against the Darkspawn, which can be best described as this world's version of orcs, and a genuine threat to the good races of the world. The real role of the Grey Wardens isn't explained until much later in the game, but in the meantime Duncan sends you out with a group of similar recruits in order to gather the Darkspawn blood necessary to do the joining ritual for new Wardens. This is mostly just an excuse to introduce the player to two of the main companions in the game, Alistair and Morgan, who happen to get along better than two peas in a pod. Alistair is introduced as more of a junior Grey Warden, and he's already gone through the joining ritual before you, but he also hasn't spent enough time with the Wardens to get any real experience with Darkspawn or combat as a whole. When you throw a little bit of Pretty Boy, Templar Training, and Naivete together, you end up getting Colin. I, I mean, a comedy relief character who is equal parts charming and daft at the same time. You quickly end up meeting Morgan as well, who is introduced as a Witch of the Wilds type character, who has a sharp tongue and always seems to know more than she lets on, just about the opposite type of person to Alistair. What makes this even better is that the game acknowledges the differences between Morgan and Alistair's beliefs and will often present them as butting heads on most topics with comedic results. Either way, you quickly retrieve the Darkspawn blood and Morgan's mother, Flemeth, ends up giving you a couple of old Grey Warden treaties with the different people from the area. So you return to camp and partake in one of the most important scenes in the narrative theme of the game when your group of recruits takes part in the joining. See, to become a Grey Warden, it requires you to drink the blood of the Darkspawn, which just so happens to be poisonous to the vast majority of people, but has a small chance to grant people supernatural abilities. As such, when the first recruit drinks some of the blood, he ends up dying on the spot, which causes the second recruit to get nervous and try to back out of the situation. Duncan tells him it it's the only way to proceed, at which point Sir Jory ends up drawing his sword and crossing paths with the wrong man. For many players, this is the point where the game establishes its bleak tone to the world when compared to many other fantasy settings, but I would argue that it's just the continuation of the themes presented by the prologues. Let's run through the origins real quick. As a mage, you end up freeing a man named Jawain, who uses his blood magic to incapacitate a group of some of the strongest Templars and mages in the area, despite the fact that he's still an apprentice. In the Noble Dwarf story, you're blamed for killing your own brother, the heir to the throne, when instead your brother was the one who instigated the entire scenario so that he would have a better chance of becoming king. The city elf was supposed to be married, but is interrupted by an angry human noble who disrupts the wedding, forcing you to kill him or be hunted down for the rest of your life. The dwarf commoner ends up failing his crime lord due a, to a series of unfortunate events, so he ends up being forced to murder his boss just so he can escape the city alive. The Dalish Elf ends up finding an ancient artifact for their people, but when they're just about to unlock the secrets of their ancestors, the mirror poisons the character, forcing them to become a Grey Warden just to survive. And finally, the human noble suffers a coup when his father sends the majority of their forces off to war, and another noble named Arl Howe uses the chance to murder the main character's entire family, at which point you escape by carving your way out of the situation with the help of Duncan. If any of these stories left you questioning what type of fantasy world this is, those hopes are then finally dashed at the joining when Duncan is forced to murder the fearful recruit in cold blood since he did not have the courage to join the Wardens. In the very next cinematic, this thematic choice to the game is then hammered in even harder as we watch a grand battle take place between the armies of Ferelden and the Darkspawn in an attempt to end their rampage early in the coming blight. 
Up until this point, the King of Ferelden named Kylan is presented as more of a knight in shining armor type character, as though he's grown up hearing the stories of the Grey Wardens and wanted to take part in their heroics to save his kingdom from the growing hordes. Unlike many of the other nobles presented in the story, he even seems to treat the elves and dwarves with respect when he first meets you, juxtaposed against the stoic nature of his left-hand man, Taren Loghain. I won't lie, if you see Loghain and don't automatically assume that he's going to be a raging asshole later in the game, you probably just don't have very much experience with fantasy story archetypes. But anyways, the upright Gollum character and the boy in golden armor go into combat with the Darkspawn and it just so happens that the guy that doesn't look like he ever sleeps betrays the king and takes the crown for himself. It wouldn't be much of a game if you just beat the main baddies in the first cinematic, now would it? So Duncan dies, Kylan dies, most of the army dies, the evil hashtag not your orcs army wins a major battle. Then you and the comedy relief character happen to be the only two Grey Wardens left in the entirety of the kingdom, and the only hope of stopping the blight. And this all had to happen in order to set up the reason for you to go on the four main quests in the game and raise an army, by recruiting the mages, the elves, the dwarves, and the humans, all of which can technically be done in any order. The game attempts to moderate the difficulty of these zones across the different paths you can take by implementing a game-wide scaling system that keeps enemies at around the same level as the player is at all times. This means that a level 5 character that enters the deep roads will end up fighting level 5 enemies, while a level 10 character will have to deal with the same encounters but with more health, armor, and DPS on the enemy mobs in order to keep them challenging for each player. I'd say that, for the most part, this system ends up working out, and I felt a pretty even difficulty curve across the entirety of the game on hard difficulty for my second playthrough. The one problem with this system is that it runs into the fact that not all the quests are made equal, and the initial mage and human quest lines are a lot less combat intensive than the elven and dwarf quest lines. Due to this, most players recommend you start out with Redcliffe and the Mage Tower before exploring the Elven Forests and Orzammar's Deep Roads, because it's a lot easier to deal with those combat-focused questlines when you have more skill choices available for different combat options. I'll be touching on it in detail later in the critique, but the combat design in Dragon Age Origins tends to just fall to pieces as you progress further into the later levels once you've hit a couple of the key spells and abilities that become really important later on. But before we get to all that fun in games and combat design, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the game can be broken down into 8 main quests. The prologue, including your character origins, saving the mage tower from the blood mage rebellion, stopping the undead occupation of Redcliffe, helping the elves deal with the werewolf curse, designating a new king for the dwarves, healing Arl Eamon with the ashes of Joste, completing the lands meet and proclaiming the new king or queen, and finally the end battle with the darkspawn in Denerim. So, by simplifying the storyline down to these eight main plot arcs, it does the game a disservice because Anyone that's played Origins can tell you that it's not quite as simple as that, but what it does do is it gives us a good way to compare the game to the later sequels when I move on to them later in the critique, as well as organizing my thoughts on Origins since each of these arcs comes with a lot for us to unpack. I usually like to start my Origins playthroughs in the Mage Tower since its unique nature allows players to work around the fact that they probably don't have that many useful skills unlocked by this point in the game. So, while the armies of Ferelden were trying to hold back the Darkspawn from the south, a mage rebellion was occurring in the Circle Tower when a group of blood mages decided to resist their imprisonment by the Templars that serve as both their guards and watchmen. See, in the world of Dragon Age, not only is a mage a weapon in of themselves, but they also have the capability of being controlled by demons from the other side of the Fade and wreaking havoc on the world of mankind. Because of this, most mages in the Dragon Age universe are inducted into magical colleges which are watched over by a group of magic-resistant knights called the Templars. What makes this just a little bit more interesting is that the knights deprive their magical resistance by ingesting a mineral called lyrium which quickly develops into an addiction which can send the Templars into madness if they take too little or too much of the substance. 
different circles of magi end up functioning differently depending on their location with some being particularly restrictive in their control of matches while others are more of a partnership of understanding between the templar and mage councils Regardless, in the Ferelden Mage Tower, a man named Uldred has led a violent upheaval of the status quo, and in the process allowed himself to become possessed by a pride demon, one of the strongest entities from this fade. As you battle your way up the tower to Uldred, you'll eventually come into contact with a sloth demon that puts your entire party to sleep in order to feast off of your nightmares. This section of the Mage Tower is what really makes it into one of the most interesting parts of the game as a whole, since a lot of the rules that govern the material world don't really apply to the dream world. As you explore the Fade, you'll end up unlocking the ability for the main character to turn into a rat, a golem, an arcane horror, and a burning man in order to do different things like knock down heavy doors, walk through fire, use magical items, and travel through small holes. As you end up exploring the area, you'll gradually end up freeing your companions from the nightmares they've been trapped in, as well as slaying the five guardians that lock the final encounter with the sloth demon that put you to sleep in the first place. Altogether, I think this is one of my favorite sequences in the entire game since it just gives you so many weird and wacky ways to explore the levels as well as rewarding you with stat points for finding all the secret areas in the dream maze. After you dispatch the demon and wake up from the mine prison, you'll end up meeting another of the recurring characters in the series named Colin. If you played through the Mage Origin story, you might have been introduced to him as a junior Templar that may or may not have had a forbidden crush on you despite the differences between Mages and Templar. But since then, he's seen so many atrocities committed by the Mages and Demons in this tower that the poor boy has almost gone insane. Through sheer force of will, he's been able to maintain an anti-magic shield for what appears to be days of torture and led him to believe that the entire tower must be purged. Over time, this will end up becoming a returning theme in Dragon Age as the Templars waver between protecting the mages from the outside world and simply burning them all at the stake in order to try and resolve their confinement once and for all. So, despite being the Dragon Age Origins representation of a mass genocide advocate, many players end up developing attachments to him after he grows as a person in the second game. Once you've dealt with the Sloth and Colin, you'll still have to deal with the Pride Demon infesting Uldred on the last floor of the tower. The sheer power of demons can really be seen as he uses blood magic to simultaneously control nearly a dozen highly trained mages and even convert some of them into abominations through sheer force of will. While the man's initial pursuit seems to be mage freedom from Templar oppression, after the demon took control of him, everything quickly got out of hand. After you're able to return the mage tower to normal, the choice is left to the player whether to recruit the remaining mages or cull all the mages and request the help of the remaining Templar from the tower. While this choice has implications for the moral ambiguity of the player, when you take a step back and look at things from a broader view, this has almost no effect on the world as a whole since there are a total of 20 mage circles when you include the 6 circles in the Tevinter Imperium. By the time the player has had any chance to interact with the entire situation, the true damage has already been done since a circle of mages has proven that mage rebellion can lead to mass demon control, causing even greater tension between Templars and mages in all the other circles. Meaning that, while the player is able to interact with an important world event, in this case they aren't actually able to shape it in the way that the choices might try to imply. This trend ends up continuing into the Redcliffe quest chain where you have to help deal with the nightly undead attack from the castle. When the player first arrives, you're presented with a small village that is all but shuttered up as people fear to leave their homes in light of the constant attacks by night. So you either have the choice of doing several fetch quests, getting to know the characters in the town and get their help in the attack that comes at night, or you can decide to just kind of ignore them all and deal with the night all by yourself. The thing is, after you get through the night, you'll end up leaving the area and basically have no reason to ever return to this area ever again. So I ended up doing all the side work to get a couple more hands during the fight and ultimately found that it didn't really matter in the grand scheme of things since you're only ever attacked by a steady stream of low difficulty shambling corpses. Just as quickly as you've arrived, you'll end up continuing on to the castle where you'll end up learning how the situation happened in the first place. 
It turns out that the blood mage Jawain that ended up running away from the circle in the mage origin got caught by some of Loghain's med. But instead of being imprisoned, like an impostate should have been, he was told to go tutor the Earl's son as he tried to hide his magical abilities and poison Earl Eamon while acting as a servant. Apparently, the magically endowed son was so upset when his father got sick that he ended up making a deal with a desire demon to keep his father alive in exchange for control of the boy's body. Then, once she had a foothold, she kept true to her word, but kept the Earl in a coma while she reanimated the bodies of the dead throughout the castle and started to cause havoc. It's only once you reach the main greeting chamber in the castle that you'll learn that the Arlesa tried to hire Jawain so that her son could hide his magical talents instead of being taken away to the circle. So, a small part of this whole mess could be blamed on her just as much as on Jawain. So, as a result of this, when Jawain offers to perform a blood ritual in order to send someone into the Fade and confront the Desire Demon, the Arlesa volunteers as a sacrifice in an attempt to trade her own life for her sons. At this point, you're basically presented with two different options, with an additional two hidden choices that you might not know unless you proceed in a very specific way. You can either storm the castle in person and kill the demon and consequently the boy, or as I think most people end up doing, sacrifice the mother in an attempt to save the boy. And ultimately, by going into the Fade to try and face the demon there, you're presented with one of the most interesting options in the game when the demon tries to make a trade with you in order to let it go free. When the demon offers you a sex scene and the love of your companions, I found it generally less interesting to me personally, but you also have the chance to earn a skill point or learn how to do blood magic, which happens to be the only way to unlock the blood magic specialization in the entire base game. So, with the weird underpinnings of evil intent that this gives every character that you enable with blood magic, this ends up getting muddled even further since you can end up specializing the Circle Loyalist win in blood magic if you want to, with basically no downsides or story-based acknowledgement that you did something she probably would never allow if she were an actual person. Regardless, the fact that this course of action is the only way to unlock blood magic in the game, which is incidentally one of the strongest mage specialties that you can use, highly encourages most combat-focused players to make a morally terrible choice. And what makes this all the worse is the fact that the game never really ends up presenting the morally white choice until it's too late. See, you can actually just leave Redcliffe Castle at this point and go back to the Circle of Magi in order to ask them to expend a bunch of lyrium and magical strength in order to send someone into the Fade and confront the demon without sacrificing the life of the Arlesa. And it will never end up presenting this choice unless you've already declined the option that Joanne presents you. It might be that I just never encountered this solution in my own playthroughs because the game has a tendency to push players towards one of the two morally grey options by purposely obscuring the option for a better conclusion by allowing both the mother and the son to survive. So why would the developers do this? Well, because it simply fits the theme of the game as a whole, as all the narratives end up running towards a denomination of grim dark fantasy stories. That was the whole goal of Origins, and in many ways their marketing shtick as they tried to differentiate the game from all the other options on the market. Baldur's Gate had already established the typical killing wraths to gods, dungeons, and dragons journey, and no one could ever compete with Torment's philosophical self-analysis, so instead of competing with these stories, Origins attempted to make video games' first attempts to move towards a fantasy world more reminiscent of Game of Thrones, even though that might have not been a thing at the time. No one in the world is truly innocent, even your mentor will murder when it suits the Brotherhood, every mage is capable of wanton destruction, the nobles are a corrupt political class, the church is a means of order and oppression in the world, the knights are drug addicts, the heroes must die to fulfill their purpose, and on and on. The game is all about these types of lose-lose situations, with the vast majority of the morally good options being either hidden or still coming with the loss of someone's life. So as the game pushes you into killing either the mother or the son, both choices will end up satisfying the player since they've been conditioned up until this point to simply accept that 
everything always has a consequence in this world. And of course, because the morally good option probably wasn't really presented as well as both the technically bad options, what's weird about the morally good option of using the Mage Tower to send you into the Fade instead of sacrificing the Mutter is that this option would probably end up taking several days worth of travel time in order across the distance between Redcliffe and the Mage Tower just to even send you into the Fade since the country is portrayed as a genuinely large place to travel across. So by trying to save both the mother and the son, you would inevitably force the village of Redcliffe to suffer at least a couple more nights of undead attacks, basically sacrificing the lives of several villagers in order to try and save the lives of a couple nobles. Whatever you choose, you end up successfully making the demon leave at least for the time being, but then you still have to deal with the problem that the Aural is stuck in a weird coma as his body struggles to stay alive. The only real option that anyone can come up with is that the party needs to find the ashes of Andraste, the Dragon Age equivalent to a Jesus character that served as an icon of good in the world until she was eventually murdered in an act of betrayal. And while you could technically go straight there and deal with the problem, it's probably a good idea to try and track down the other allies in the world since you'll end up meeting dragons and a cult of heretics along the way to her ashes, so I'd personally recommend dealing with that as one of the last things you do during this phase in the game. Instead, now is a pretty good time to start to deal with the elves in the Brazilian woods and get a good idea of the outside world after you've just spent the last two main quests almost entirely inside castle walls. When you first encounter the elves, you'll learn that this specific tribe of Dalish has started to suffer a terrible pandemic that's been turning anyone that catches the infection into a werewolf. The village elder asks you for help hunting down an ancient wolf somewhere deep within the forest, since the heart of this beast is the only thing that he thinks can make a cure for the affliction on his people. This also happens to be a good chance to meet the Dalish people if you haven't had the chance to experience their culture up until this point, since they're actually a nomadic people who try their best to follow the ways of the old elves and honor nature like most stereotypical elf races. Eventually you'll end up making your way out into the forest, at which point you'll meet a group of werewolves that end up talking with you and basically ask you to politely abandon your quest or die which the player is basically forced to refuse. Since I already had a good idea where the story ends up going in this area, I tried to parlay with them and see if I could avoid combat, but the aggressive tendencies of the werewolves end up conflicting with your good intentions and you're forced into combat with them no matter what you do. As a result of this, you'll end up literally carving through rank after rank of werewolves as you make your way further and further into the forest until you eventually find yourself at a weird temple that seems to be their home. This entire section of the game is the most stereotypical dungeoneering-esque crypt delving that you'll end up finding in the entire game, which is simultaneously really endearing and exhausting at the same time. Along the way you'll end up dealing with a small dragon, giant spider tunnels, an optional locked door puzzle, several trap rooms that spew fire at you while you fight off waves of skeletons, and finally a boss battle with an arcane horror that blinks away whenever you get into melee contact with him, which was really annoying. While you do all of this, your bank of saved up health and mana potions will start to dwindle and any wounds you receive from characters getting knocked out will start to accumulate as you try to make your way through the area without wasting your injury repair kits. It all comes together to present players with a different experience than anything they've seen from the Origins game up until this point since both the Redcliffe storyline and the Mage Tower storyline have a much greater emphasis on dialogue choices and unique fade mechanics when compared to the forest dungeon crawl that the elves end up sending you on. But as you'll soon learn, the bright side of all this dungeon delving is that you will end up swimming in cash as a result from this expedition into the woods, and after I sold all the gear I found in the temple, I found that I finally had more cash than I ever needed for the first time in the game since you earn around 50 gold from just this one quest. Regardless of how unique the gameplay is compared to what you might have experienced up until this point, the end of the dungeon ends up presenting players with yet another morally grey choice, so it turns out that the werewolves were actually a group of humans that happened to be trying to set up a village in the area around a hundred years ago, but they suffered a terrible curse that turned them into the werewolves you see today. 
The keeper who initially asked you to solve the werewolf problem happened to be the same elf that cursed the humans when they murdered his son and raped his daughter, resorting to magic to torment the people who took everything that he loved in the world. But now that a hundred years have passed, the curse is starting to target new humans that had nothing to do with his pain, and they want nothing more than just to be released from its thrall and live a peaceful life once more. If you end up accepting their request to talk with the Keeper and try to resolve the situation, you'll turn around to find the Keeper in the entrance to the temple as though he was trying to check whether you would actually hold up your end of the task he set you with. The wolves and the keeper named Zatharian end up talking, at which point you can either side with the Lady of the Forest in order to lift the curse at the cost of the elf mage's life, or with Zatharian to put an end to the werewolves. Once again, the player is meant to feel torn at this point between the morality of punishing a group of people for their deeds that others have taken, or to take the life of one of the only elves that has found a way to achieve immortality, like the ancestors that came before him and only meant the curse to act as a just punishment for crimes against his clan and family. Incidentally, I ended up choosing to lift the curse and allow the werewolves to become human once again, since this option ends up saving both the human lives and the elves, but even in this case of pragmatism first, you still end up taking the life of the Keeper and his daughter's soul, the spirit of the forest. Or in the case that you think that either the werewolves or the elves ended up crossing a line that should not be crossed, you could just decide to murder the entire group, which inevitably leaves the other side to live in peace and join your army, regardless of the moral values of such a choice. So now that you've dealt with three of the main quests and the resulting multiple choice options that don't really give you any good endings, you still have two more tasks to complete and some of the most important quests in the entire game as far as their implications on the general lore of the series. Mind you, your actions will have almost no effect on the world, since the writers still need the games to follow a logical order without too much individuality, since that would just be expensive. Still, as you make your way through the dwarf storyline, you'll end up learning some really interesting things about the actual history of the world as you delve deep into the underground lair of the Darkspawn. The true purpose of the Dwarven story is to help them determine who will be their new king, since they cannot afford to reinforce your army as long as the council is divided on who will be their next leader. Your choice hangs between some interesting options with the son of the old king who happened to murder his brothers in order to become the rightful heir, as well as just generally being a total douche, or a friend of the late king who happened to be there when the king told him that he did not want his son to take the throne after his death. And so he wants to honor the will of the old king, in order to serve as a voice for reason and justice in this time of need. But of course things aren't quite as simple since the heir is also portrayed as the better choice as king since he's more interested in shaking up the status quo of Orzammar and eventually improving the caste system that rigidly holds all the dwarves in their respective place in the world. Meanwhile, the good friend of the king, Lord Haramont, will instead encourage the dwarves to hold to the traditions of the past and continue down their current path regardless of the fact that the dwarven race is struggling to keep up with the never-ending darkspawn threat. On an emotional level, the choice is pretty easy, especially if you ever played through the dwarf noble st origin story since the rightful heir happens to be a rightful piece of shit to just about everyone he ends up crossing paths with. So when I eventually chose to support Haramont to become the new king, I more or less felt it was the best choice up until the last moments of the game when it actually reveals to you what their rules might do in the long term for the dwarven people. Regardless, the path to crowning a new king involves doing some busy work tasks around the city before eventually trying to take down the dwarven smuggling company based in the slums district, and then finding one of the most intelligent dwarven inventors of their time that had recently gotten lost in the deep roads. Incidentally, during this process, the Great Wardens end up solving almost every problem that the dwarves are really struggling with over the course of a couple days. Like, they don't already have an entire dwarven army that could probably have dealt with this all far in the past. Similar to how all of the allied races just so happen to have problems they could probably fix on their own, but simply choose not to really bother with until a group of four strangers ends up walking into town. Oh wow. So, you're sent deeper into the underground to try and find this dwarven paragon who's gone missing, 
which you'll of course succeed in doing because a group of four travelers is apparently a more capable group than the dwarven armies that have been fighting back the darkspawn for literally millennia. Despite the logical gaps behind the journey, I found that this path into the deep roads is actually pretty fun as you gradually make your way further and further behind darkspawn lines and get to see some of the more gruesome architecture of the hashtag not a zombie orc race as the walls are covered with rotten flesh and body parts. Many players have nightmares about the sheer length of the deep roads which I've never really understood since my journey from start to finish only took three hours in total which is relatively similar to the total time that I spent in the Brazilian forest as well. It might be that people find the repetitive dwarven architecture and caves to be kind of claustrophobic and certainly less beautiful than the forest dungeon, but even then the game tries to change things up by developing different biomes like the old abandoned tigs, the giant chasm bridges, the flesh-covered hallways, and the final resting place of the golem anvil. While it's all underground, the small changes end up doing enough to make each area through the deep road section feel unique, like you're making genuine progress through the mega dungeon as a whole. What I will say is that the deep roads feel like they end up having a false ending since around 80% through the quest you'll end up meeting the Darkspawn Matron, which is slowly revealed to be a dwarf that was mutilated by Darkspawn until she was capable of siring even more to join the Legion. So, after the game spends around 30 minutes building up this grand battle as you explore the horror of realization and find out that the Darkspawn are basically messed up dwarf babies, then the game just pulls a bait and switch and tells you that you've still got around 30 more minutes of progress until you actually reach the end of the quest path. So you meet up with Bronca, who reveals that she's been using the matron that you've just killed as a never-ending source of darkspawn in order to try and break through the traps set by the last paragon that ended up hiding away the secret behind creation of new golems. As usual, your group of four adventurers is able to accomplish what two years worth of darkspawn is not, and you break your way through all of the defenses set up around the anvil of the void, only to find out that the paragon that first made the anvil has actually turned himself into a golem in order to eternally watch over his creation. Once again, you're presented with a choice between letting Bronca use the Anvil of the Void in order to take the souls of criminal dwarves and put them into golems in order to strengthen the dwarven armies, or you can heed the advice of the old Paragon and continue to hide his technology since its cost is too great for the dwarves to bear. And of all the choices in the main game, this is the one that might have the greatest effect on the world as a whole. But if you do end up choosing to give the technology back to the dwarves, they inevitably get over their heads with sacrificing souls to the stone and have to close their doors to the world as the city of Orzammar is forced to quarantine itself away from the world. So even if you save the dwarves from the darkspawn threat that looks like it might be about to overwhelm them, you inevitably push them into confrontation with the surface denizens that will have just as bad an impact on the overall health of the dwarven nation. Anyways, you end up bringing a crown back from your confrontation at the Anvil of the Void, regardless of who you ended up siding with between the two paragons, and then crown the next king of Orzammar who honors the treaties and gives you his aid. Do these choices feel impactful? Yeah, you're basically choosing between sacrificing thousands of dwarven lives to the stone or risking the loss of the entire dwarven civilization to the darkspawn, as well as choosing between a just king and a rightful king. They're hard choices to make, but given the player's series of hard choices, doesn't necessarily make any of those choices impactful, since no matter what you do, the writers have just as many excuses as to how those choices can result in exactly the same outcome. So while you, as the player, might have felt like it was a hard choice, when we look back at all these options from the context of the later games, you might as well have flipped a coin and chosen randomly as far as the actual long-term effects of these history-changing options. So now that you've successfully recruited the mages, elves, and dwarves for the attack on the Darkspawn, you'll start to encounter the second main portion of the game that revolves around the problem with trying to recruit the humans for your cause, since it was their actions under Loghain that initially resulted in the failure at Ostagar. 
I've always found the character development behind Maktir Loghain as a villain more or less fails to really explain why he is morally reprehensible man that he is by the time that you see him in Dragon Age Origins, because a lot of the backstory behind the way he found his beliefs is only really explained in the standalone novels The Stolen Throne and The Colin. Essentially, what the video game fails to explain to players is that the vast majority of his life, Loghain has been fighting against the Orlesians, which serve more or less as an analog for the French Empire during the Imperial Age. The Orlesians used to govern the lands of the Ferelden Kingdom for 58 years as a colonial state levied with harsh taxes and even harsher laws that served to keep the nation in a state of constant fear and poverty in order to try and keep the Ferelden people subjugated despite their relatively similar strength to the Orlesians' empire. As such, it was only due to the heroic actions of Loghain and King Merrick that the Ferelden people were eventually able to escape the dictatorship of the Orlesians and become a sovereign nation once more. Despite their established self-dependency, Loghain could never trust the Orlesians again, a fear which is strengthened even further when Loghain finds his king imprisoned in Kinloch Hold, which had been captured during an Orlesian excursion into Ferelden lands. So, not only has Loghain fought in the largest rebellion in recent history against the Orlesian Empire, but he's also seen his king abducted by an Orlesian mage who happened to be using darkspawn magic to strengthen his own magical powers. This is all in addition to the Warden's involvement in a coup d'etat around 200 years prior where a Warden commander with royal blood tried to take control over the Ferelden throne and subsequently resulted in the banishment of the Grey Wardens from the area until King Marek ended up letting them return during his reign. All of this coalesces behind the scenes in Loghain's mind to mean that he believes that the Orlesians are consorting with the Darkspawn in order to start another blight in the Ferelden lands and use the excuse to weaken their country once again. Likewise, due to their connection with the blight that has proven to ally with the Orlesians in the past, Loghain also believes that the Grey Wardens are conspiring with the enemies of his nation in their own attempts to gain more power over Ferelden lands after their initial failure 200 years ago. And it's only in light of all these facts which are never presented to the player in the game that you can finally start to understand Loghain as a man that is willing to sacrifice anything even his own morals and the son of his best friend in order to guarantee that the Ferelden people never have to suffer under Orlesian rule again. His story is astoundingly well developed in the larger narrative, but the way the game presents all this information always portrays Loghain as a nearly totally unhinged man who only takes actions out of his power-hungry greed for the throne. Of course, throughout all of this, his dependency on Rendon Howe for the vast majority of his political power only undermines his integrity even more as we see Howe repeatedly encourage the man to resort to underhanded tactics like assassinating the Grey Wardens, enslaving the Denerim Cine Elves, poisoning Arl Even, and even imprisoning his own daughter in an attempt to retain power and keep his country out of Orlesian control. His actions are terrible and heinous, but at least they can start to make sense given the larger context of Loghain's life. As a result of his control of the Denerim political climate, your advisors indicate that your only option to gain the support of the Ferelden Kingdom would be to declare a lands meet with the help of Arl Eamon and take control of the throne back from Loghain. And of course, to set all this in motion, our heroes first have to track down the ashes of Andraste back to a small town called Haven, which is at the bottom of a great mountain range. As you start to explore the town, you'll inevitably discover that the people of Haven are acting kind of weird, and a cult of dragon worshippers has actually taken control of the town in order to hide an underground dragon breeding program hidden up in the mountains. It just so happens that this cult is stationed in the same area as the Ashes of Anjaste happen to be located since a dragon decided to roost over her temple by pure coincidence. Even the ghostly guardian of the Andrastean temple will admit that the dragon really has 
nothing to do with Andraste and is kind of just bad luck that both the dragon and a cult happen to have set up shop right outside the final resting place of Dragon Age Jesus. So you make it through all of these obstacles in order to make it up to her temple in the mountains. Then you complete the task laid out for you by the immortal guardian of the palace only to find yourself in front of one of the most important religious artifacts in current history. And like any other dickwad Bioware character, you of course have the option to side with the Dragon Cult and purposefully defile Andraste's ashes by pouring dragon blood into the urn, since the cult thinks that it's the last thing holding back the true power of the dragon that roosts on this mountain. What's odd about this is that this is the second time in the game that an organization has decided to force you to kill around 90% of their total mound power in order to finally reach a leader thoughtful enough to even offer to work with you since the exact same thing happened with the werewolves during the elven storyline. I just don't understand the reasoning behind these villains like it somehow took the deaths of the vast majority of their men before they even think that you might be a problem worth dealing with. But whatever, let's say you're not an asshole who decides to destroy a source of all healing ashes, which serves as the world's equivalent to the Holy Grail, and you even go so far as to allow the historian that led you to this place to know that he was right and the urn was actually here all along. But what does this actually do to the world after all? Yes, the ending slides do reveal that the Andrastians start to make a pilgrimage to this site of holy power, but as quickly as that all started, the temple collapses and the ashes are not recoverable despite the combined effort of the entire Chantry to correct this catastrophe. Oh well, at least you meant to do some good, even if it didn't end up lasting very long. No matter what you choose to do here, you'll come back down to Redcliffe and revive the Arl, who usually has to learn that you incidentally either killed his son or his wife, but he kind of forgives you since you literally brought him back to life and saved his fiefdom. So now Arl Eamon is kind of important for you to be friends with because he's the only person with enough political power and enough distrust for Loghain to actually call a landsmeet for all the nobles to come together and decide on who will be king in the coming days. Up until this point, you'll have had chances to go to Denerim, the capital of Hereldon, in the past, but now that you've reached a tipping point, the game starts to focus almost entirely on the capital as the center point for the storyline and basically the last important location in the game. As you explore the city, you'll end up locating several quest hubs for the Chantry, the Circle Mages, the Thieves Guild, the Guardsmen, the Assassin's Guild, and the city which serve as the starting points for the vast majority of the side quests in the entire game. The problem with this is that almost all of these quests are presented to the player as pure busy work, a sense of unimportance that is only strengthened by the fact that every single one of them is delivered to the player via a message board that you basically just ignore as you pick up a set of five quests at a time, similar to the quest boards from The Witcher 3. After you've picked up all of these tasks, I would frequently find myself just discovering random quest related events that I would do the inevitable press right click to complete task action and then return to the quest giver for a little bit of cash and ultimately no real player choice or even understanding. I actually ended up doing a lot of these quests just to see if they ever ended up going anywhere meaningful for the player which they never really do. The guard quests have a couple opportunities to sell things peacefully with dialogue options instead of a fight, but no matter what you do, you basically just always end up following the bidding of the quest giver and doing whatever they ask you to do. Even in the case of the assassination quest, the targets don't ever make an attempt to bargain with you and instead just attack you on sight, so even the black hand quests in this game are pretty redundant. As far as a little padding goes, I guess it's okay for the game and maybe tacked on two to three more hours to the main campaign, but it's also not the type of gameplay that's going to interest most players who have experienced doing tick the box quests in just about every other modern video game. You know, now that I think about it, none of the other games before Dragon Age Origins in the Bioware catalog end up using notice boards in order to deliver mass quests to the player. 
Sure, Baldur's Gate might have had some redundant bring me 10 wolf's pelt type quests, but at least all of them were presented to the player by a person instead of ripping a contract off of a message board. Unfortunately, this type of quest design where you don't actually talk with a person ends up following the series forward into the later campaigns with the Chantry board in DA2, although it ends up being much less pronounced in the sequel, whereas it seems in Origins that the majority of the side quests were delivered in this way. While most of the message board quest lines basically result in one track series of events, with most of the side quests delivered by actual people, you're actually given a little bit of choice as far as the rewards in most cases. Take for example the handful of quests in the elven encampment earlier in the game. You can either choose to help cure a sickly Hala or put her out of your misery for different rewards. You can collect iron bark from the trees in the forest to turn into either a sword or a chess piece. And you can find a man's missing wife, then decide to either tell him the truth about what happened or lie to him. They're all just about as interesting as the message board quests in terms of difficulty, but at least they allow you to interact with someone instead of just getting random quest markers show up on your Mac. Ironically, since most of the side quests end up involving characters that are really unimportant in the grand scheme of things, you would think the game would be more willing to let you have lasting effects on the people around you, but most of the time your choices have no real effect in the world, as usual. Take for instance the quest for Dagna where she asked the warden for permission to join the Ferelden Circle of Magi in order to study with the mages there, which the player can either assist her with or totally shut down her plans by telling her father about the thing. Nonetheless, even if the player attempts to sabotage Dagna's plan, she will still manage to go to the surface world and join a circle of magi in order to learn the skills she needed to serve as a main arcanist for the future Inquisitor. So, while this connection between a small origin side quest and your Inquisitor's companions during the sequel looks strong, the truth is that your actions didn't really end up having any effect on the world and might even contradict with the player intentions behind the choices in their original. So, by now you've done a good job exploring Denerim, seen everything that the quest boards have to offer as far as gameplay goes, and now you're ready to continue the main story. The only thing left to do before you start the next sequence is to save the current queen and daughter of Loghain, which she's chosen to hold captive in a political ploy to blackmail Arl Eamon, and claim that your faction has abducted the queen instead of himself. It's so crazy that it actually makes sense, and given the true purpose behind his actions in trying to keep Orlesian power to a minimum, it makes sense that he doesn't particularly care about the status of his own kin in terms of power since he doesn't actually care about the throne. Incidentally, this gives the Warden an opportunity to recruit Queen Honora to their cause and basically ensures that no matter who ends up becoming regent at the end of the lands meet, as long as Loghain is not in power then it will suit the needs of the player. I neglected to mention up until this point, but Alistair, the lovable buffoon that's followed you from the very start of your journey, also happens to be a bastard of King Merrick, who held the throne before King Kyan. And despite the protests of basically everyone who knows Alistair, to include Alistair, he's basically the only option for the new King of Ferelden up until you get Queen Enora on your side. Because of the second option at your disposal, you get thrown into almost exactly the same choice as you had to make in Arasomar as far as giving the kingdom to a good man but a bad king, or choosing to uphold the bad woman but a good queen, and this time, the true character of the options is revealed a lot better than in the dwarven scenario. See, in Orzammar, the only real way to learn anything about the two options for king is literally just trying to ask every random dwarf you end up meeting in the city. The problem with this is that you don't actually get to meet either of the contenders until you've already completed several quests and basically expressed your allegiance to one or the other, at which point it feels like it's too late to change your mind. What makes the humans lands meet much more impactful is that most players would have had 
an opportunity to get to know Alistair over the course of the entire game and really understand what makes him tick. See, Alistair decides to follow you after the events of Ostagar, despite the fact that he would technically be the senior warden in Ferelden, simply because he doesn't feel comfortable being a leader. This conversation ends up coming up several points over the course of the game where he laments that it's a really good thing that you became the de facto leader of your group because he doesn't believe that he will be up to the task, a lack of self-confidence that doesn't really inspire a kingly expectation. This is then made even worse by the fact that Alistair will basically consider it a betrayal if you name him king by that point in the game. So all the players that don't like him already will already assume that he would make a bad king, and all the players that do like him are basically begged not to put him on the throne. As a result, I always thought that the final choice of the lands meet, whether you want to crown Anora or Alistair, basically isn't even a choice since Anora is a genuinely better option despite any political grey inclinations she might have. And that's basically the entire plot of the game. You escape from Ostagar and recruit the four major races in the area after encountering some particularly bad problems getting the aid of the humans, until finally you're ready to defeat the Darkspawn Horde on the field of battle. The game whisks you away from Denerim back to the states of Redcliffe where you've decided to consolidate all of your armies when the scouts suddenly report that the main Darkspawn army has already passed your position and is a planning on attacking Denerim. Despite the fact that most players will have just come from the Landsmeek, traveling along the most likely path that the giant army of darkness could take, you supposedly failed to notice several thousand zombie orcs marching towards the largest human city in the kingdom. Refusing to accept defeat, your generals conduct a forced march all the way to the capital in order to try and catch up to the darkspawn, at which point you arrive to find the city engulfed in flames. This changes what might have been a heroic defense of the castle or a giant battle upon the open fields into your basic dungeon section as you make your way through urban themed portions of the city to reach the archdemon that has set up roost on top of the grand fortress. This section is supplemented by the ability to call in reinforcements to battle as you make your way through the city, calling in your allies that you earn the loyalty of like the humans, dwarves, and elven rangers. And one of the coolest touches in the game is that by making certain choices like recruiting the golems or the werewolves, you get access to those respective super troops that can actually be somewhat useful compared to the stock standard troops. Ultimately though, I never felt the encounters in the city were all that difficult to deal with using just my standard party of four, and in those few times that I did call in reinforcements, the best they could really do was act as a slight distraction for the trash enemies. I like the idea behind the implementation of calling in all your allies, but in practice it never feels impactful or necessary due to the limited difficulty in the section as a whole. By this point your tanks are just about invulnerable, and your mages have access to so much AoE control that I could basically kill everything on the screen with one or two spells. With or without the help of your allies, you make your way to the center of the city, up through the tower, and finally confront the archdemon that only a warden can defeat. While you were getting juked by the darkspawn in the setup scene at Redcliffe, you learn that while normal people can technically defeat the archdemon in battle, only a warden can truly defeat them by cutting off their soul from the surrounding darkspawn, preventing the archdemon from immediately coming back in the body of another. The actual science behind this is never really explained, whether you take in this soul and then commit suicide or if the soul of the warden is consumed along with the dark god upon merging, or some other combination of magical logic that are usually some of the more interesting lore and fantasy settings. But regardless, as you steal yourself for the ultimate sacrifice, Morgan will approach the player with a proposition asking you to trap the soul of the go old god into the body of an unborn child, sparing both the warden and the child's fate in the process. If you relent to this request, she will either have sex with a male main character, Alistair, or Loghain, depending on who you might have left in your party at the time. Conceiving a child on the eve of battle in a more ritual than sensual intercourse scene. 
For players that don't decide to engage in any of the romance options in the game, this might be the only sex scene that's presented to you and which basically justifies your lack of interest since it's not really that big of a deal. The entire scene lasts maybe 30 seconds max and all the characters retain their clothes for the entire scene. So for players that have a vested interest in the romance between the MC and the companion characters, it might have some feels good emotions behind the scenes, but always from more of a sentimental perspective than a purely sexual interest. You bought a game rated M, not adults only, so anything you see is meant to imply more of a deeper character connection than a genuinely stimulating scene to watch. Regardless, Morgan presents her option with enough earnestness for the cause that many players that like her character will end up taking the option, a choice that actually has some of the biggest ramifications in the series as the whole, despite how unimportant it might seem right now. I'll end up talking about the final fight with the Archdemon with a little bit more detail when I go over the combat in Dragon Age Origins, but suffice to say I defeated the dragon, sucked up the spirit into Hoover Baby, and finally got my just rewards with a ceremony scene reminiscent of the 6th Star Wars episode ending. You're honored by the queen and asked for any boon at all, to which my mage character asked for independence on behalf of the Circle of Magi which actually ties pretty well into the direction the series takes in the next game. Queen Enora kind of waves her hands and says she'll see what she can do, but as with all the choices in the game, it's kind of left vague what will actually end up happening. You're then given one last chance to talk to all your companions at the feast, at which point you retire to your room and dream long and hard about a PowerPoint that tells you about what ends up happening to the world as a result of your actions throughout the game. This is the one scene where the game truly explores how your choices might affect the world and it lasts about 2 minutes in total. While watching it, I found it genuinely interesting learning about how the dwarves relied too much upon the stone golems and ended up entering a war with the surface world just as they had started to win the war against the darkspawn due to their need for more souls. Likewise, the fact that one tiny side quest where a religious dwarf asks you to help him open up a chantry in Orzammar ends up leading to riots and the threat of another crusade was something I never expected from such an unimportant seeming quest during the Orzammar section. Then there's of course the story of Dagna and how you most likely helped her join the Circle of Magi where she ended up publishing several great works on the nature of Lyrium. And that's just about everything I remember about the epilogue slides off the top of my head without looking back at the old footage. Everything else, like the progression of the Ferelden crown, the state of the mages, the experience of the Dalish tribes, the fate of the wardens, it's all just blended together in a way that all their outcomes seemed boring and not worth remembering off the top of my head. At the time that I first experienced these outcomes, it all felt well deserved, but in retrospect, it was mostly the events surrounding the dwarves that truly surprised and fascinated me with the course of the world. And so, we come to the question of epilogue slideshows and their relative worth in video games as a whole. I remember returning all the souls to the wheel at the end of Pillars of Eternity, but little else. I remember how I cleansed the water at the end of Fallout 3, but nothing else. I remember how I set Narcissa free from her curse at the end of Pathfinder Kingdom, but nothing else. All of which were games which that left me feeling rewarded and satisfied at the tie-offs for all their storylines, but several years later I can't remember much about what actually happened, and the same ends up being the case for me with not only Origins, but Dragon Age as a whole. This lack of memory for such things doesn't necessarily undermine their effects in the present, but it does make me question the importance in considering them for the greater context of choice effects. Take for example the player's choice to spare Jawain when you first meet up with him in the dungeon below Castle Redcliffe. That choice ends up having immediate effects on the game less than 30 minutes later when he gives you the option to use a blood ritual to save the life of the little boy. Not only is the sequence of events logical, but it's also very memorable since the player actually gets to take part in and choose options based upon the effects. 
Juxtaposed against this is the request for the circle to be granted independence, at which point the long-term effects of the option are only really explored in the epilogue slideshow. However satisfying seeing those long-term effects might have been in the moment that I saw them happen, since I never got to experience them as more than a 30 second long text blurb, I never really got to feel those effects in the same way that Jawain is able to alter the course of my human plotline. And this is the main problem that I find myself running into with the storyline behind Dragon Age Origins, that as a hero tasked with defending the realm from the onslaught of the Scourge, all of your actions and reactions have grand consequences on the livelihoods of the people you meet. But due to the focus of the game and the fact that you never have the opportunity to meaningfully return to any area that you already explored, you never get to see your aftermath firsthand. After you cure the werewolf curse, you leave. After you free Redcliffe Castle and town, you leave. After you save the mage tower, you leave, and after you grant the dwarves the power to make golems, you never return. If you ever do decide to come back to those areas due to a side quest or something, it's as though the area is in a type of stasis. You'll never see the golems wandering the halls of Arzamar, or the elves continuing their nomadic ways, and the circle mage leaders will perpetually spend all their time at the entrance hall to the tower since their offices are obviously still gunked up with the bits of human flesh. And so you're always vaguely aware that your choices may or may not result in the deaths of thousands of people, but when I don't get to see those effects firsthand, it never gets a chance to really feel real in my mind. Maybe I just have a really big issue with object permanence, but if I don't get to experience any effects on the world, it might as well be a theoretical debate on morals as far as the permanence my choices have on the world. So, while I've spent nearly an hour talking strictly about the story behind Dragon Age Origins, the actual task of talking with people is the vast minority of the game. In even the most story-centric portions of the game, like the Redcliffe Castle quest, you only ever end up approaching around 46% of the game time spent on dialogue and cutscenes. And that's a statistic that I've literally calculated directly from my own gameplay footage across the 1 hour 40 minute long Redcliffe arc. And this percentage goes down much further when you start to calculate the time spent on story in dungeon quests, like the entire elf plotline, which only takes 29% of the game spent on dialogue. Instead, the vast majority of your time spent in Dragon Age Origins will either be in combat or walking around and looting things in the world. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing in of itself, since many games focus on combat and gameplay when compared to storylines. Otherwise, it starts to approach a mixed media movie experience like the Quantic Dreams games, but Origins is best known for its plot lines instead of its gameplay, despite the objective fact that it is mostly combat and walking around. So how did Origins end up making a combat system that mostly just melds into the background in people's minds, and yet is still capable of presenting a genuine tactical challenge on the harder difficulty options? The simple answer is that they just adapted and organized the traditional CRPG experience into a modern UI, creating a form of D&D light for a new user base. This choice is quite frankly brilliant from a marketing standpoint since it attracts veterans of the RPG genre who are more familiar with game systems like Baldur's Gate and Neverwinter Nights, while also simplifying the worst parts of the CRPG nonsense that scare away newcomers to tactical gameplay. So as someone who grew up playing these traditional second edition inspired games, I immediately felt comfortable with this style of game that I found in Origins. While new players on the Xbox who still don't know what Thaco, AC, and BAB stand for were able to enjoy the game just as much. And this is actually a good thing for the genre as a whole because most of these acronyms made absolutely no sense outside of their implementation into the tabletop system and only served to scare off people that might have been genuine fans of old Bioware games. 
Origins actually did a lot of work to simplify the game down to its base parts to the point where it took things a little too far and made it harder to understand what was happening under the hood of the game for people who like mechanics. They ended up replacing the old systems of armor class and base attack bonus with a new system that compares the offensive attack score versus the enemy defense score to determine your chance of hitting the enemy. So this is definitely easier to parse at first glance than the idea of getting your Thacko as low as it could in the old Bioware games, but when you actually dive into the math behind it all, it means that an attacker and a defender that have the same attack and defense scores will result in a 54% chance to hit. Every point of attack and defense over the enemy results in this percentage chance to hit changing by 1% in their respective direction. It's a workable simplification of the old armor class system, but it ends up leading to some really awkward situations in the mid game where it just feels like your character struggles to hit anything. Also, due to the ink incremental nature of the system, by dumping all of your 3 stat points per level into your primary attack stat for the class, you're only able to increase your chance to hit by 1.5%, which is so hard to notice in the actual gameplay that it might as well not change at all. This also runs into problems as you get further into the games and the enemies continue to scale with your character so someone that starts to run into hit chance problems can find themselves even further behind the curve as you gain levels since the enemies are growing at almost the same place as the main character. While I'm personally not a fan of game systems that make me feel like I have to dump all my stat points into attack just so I can keep pace, this is by far the lesser problem than the armor stat on characters. Dragon Age Origins implements what I would call integer damage mitigation systems, where every point that the player has in armor reduces the enemy damage per hit by that set amount. This can be mitigated by using the armor piercing effects and magical damage, but as anyone that's played Dragon's Dogma can attest to, using a straight up damage invulnerability stat is a nightmare to balance in games. The reason this is such a big problem is that it punishes low damage high speed attacks like Dadgers by reducing the damage from almost every single attack to close to one, using the same integer mitigation for every hit in a flurry of blows. Meanwhile, a great sword user might only make one attack for every three dagger blows, but they suffer the same mitigation integer only once. Look, I did the math for a simple explanation of this situation on the screen when comparing a 30 dps dagger versus a 30 dps greatsword under the rules of this system and you can see that the heavy hitting weapon will do seven times the damage under the same conditions as an equal dps dagger set under this rule set the game tries to balance all of this by allowing rogues to use armor penetration skills stealth effects backstab damage bonuses and the benefits of attack speed on percentage to hit systems but if you're playing a mage, you get the privilege of ignoring just about all of these mechanics at the same time. Unlike physical damage, magical effects rely on a percentage-based elemental resistance, so your enemies can develop up to a 75% damage reduction for a specific spell type, which is actually much more beneficial for the long-term power growth curve. When the game tries to balance integer reductions that keep damage close to 1, then any increase of a couple points of damage can result in 300-500% to increases in power from only a couple damage points. But when you use a percentage-based damage reduction, the player power will grow uniformly over the course of the game because 25% of a 20 damage spell is still 5 damage, which will still grow point by point as your mage increases in spell power over the course of the game, compared to the physical damage versus armor conundrum that will jump around the place wildly based upon the gear you may or may not find. Because of this, warriors have the capability of feeling incredibly overpowered for 2 or 3 levels until they feel like they can barely damage a group of spiders before rapidly returning to feeling OP when you get a new sword at the end of a quest. Unfortunately, this is only a small reason why using mages feels so good when compared to rogues and warriors, since they're able to supplement their consistent power curve gains by further specializing into different sets of spells. Warriors and rogues may 
technically have access to the same amount of skills that a mage does, but all of their skill sections are blocked out into sets of 12 skills for each weapon type, like the 12 dual wield skills, the 12 two handed skills, and the 12 sword and board skills. Because of this, warriors and rogues end up feeling very restricted in the direction that you can take those characters since your path is basically chosen for you as soon as you make that first choice which weapon you want them to focus on. Mages take the other side of the coin on this idea by dividing the spell types into blocks of 12 like the other classes but allowing the player to mix and match your favorite skills since they all rely on the same set of weapons to use all those different skills. As such, the mage characters can choose to dip 4 points into entropy for the best hexes, 4 points into life skills for all the healing effects, 3 points into elemental for fireball skill, 4 points into spirit for the mana burn skill, and continue to do this across the board as you put together a list of spells that you find the most useful in the game to address any situation. This results in mage characters feeling very powerful if you can figure out which spells are good and which ones are worth skipping since you can always just beeline your way to all the best skills in each school as a master of all trades. And trust me, some of the mage spells are undoubtedly the most important skills in the game due to their ability to efficiently CC an entire room at a time. Sure, warriors get an early game stun with their shield bash or their pommel strike, but a mage can do that just as well by picking up Winter's Grasp at level 1, and then expand upon that investment even more by picking up Frost Cone that is almost a guaranteed freeze even against boss mobs at the end of the game. Likewise, ranged characters can pick up Scattershot to consistently stun 4 enemies at a time but a mage can pick up both force field and paralyze room within the same time period to take out two enemies for 15 to 20 seconds at a time. Then as the mage gets into the late game, you can also get access to crushing prison that can take enemies out of the fight and damage them at the same time. Fireball is accessible within three levels, will do consistently good damage even at the end of the game due to mage scaling and still knocks down every enemy caught within its effect. And the Coupe de Grace. Any mage with the blood magic specialization can use the blood wound spell to cast crushing prison on every single enemy in an AoE area around the size of the entire screen. And what makes all of this better is that you can chain all these CC effects together when you have multiple mages in the party. Don't want to deal with that mage until everything else in the room is dead? Just chain force field him the entire fight, and you can deal with him one on one whenever you want to. Not only do mages provide an incredible amount of CC to the team, but they're also the only class that can heal. They can boost stamina regeneration, they can revive characters mid battle, they can buff your melee characters, they can enchant your party weapons with elemental damage or armor piercing, they can one shot almost any enemy mage in the game with mana clash, and they can do a better job tanking with a sword and board than even a warrior can do. Mages are undoubtedly amazing in this game, to the point that using warriors and rogues feels like the wrong decision the vast majority of the time. You may want to bring along a warrior to make use of some of the loot you find along the way, or you want to bring along one of the rogues for their character development like getting to know Leliana just a little bit better, but if there was the opportunity to bring for along a fourth mage in the party, you know I would be very tempted by this game on the harder difficulty settings. On my most recent playthrough of the game, I beat the game on hard difficulty since I had already developed a pretty good idea for what spells were good and which weren't during my first playthrough all those years ago, and I'll say that the vast majority of the difficulty in the game is in mechanical knowledge and not tactical skill. If you pick up the right skills early on, the rest of the game will be an absolute breeze even on the harder difficulties, while the opposite can also be the case where I remember struggling my way through normal difficulty the first time I played the game, just due to poor skill choices on the part of my mages that playthrough. The warrior and rogue archetypes are so streamlined that you can't even really mess things up if you have half a sense to just stay focused on one weapon type but the mages in your party are your key to a smooth ride or one of the most tactically frustrating experiences of your life.
Even if you make the wrong choices early on, you might not be able to even realize your mistakes until several hours later when the game starts to ramp things up. The combat sections of the game are basically tied with three types of encounters in Origins with standard fights, set piece fights, and boss battles. The standard fights are your typical mob placement that the player will randomly end up walking into as you make your way through the story. A couple of werewolves in the forest, another set of darkspawn in the underground, or a scattering of undead throughout Castle Redcliffe. All of them basically just meant to get the player into combat system for a couple of seconds and distract them from the walking around all the time. On top of these standard battles, the game routinely places you into set piece battles where the enemies are placed just a little bit more intentionally to set up an ambush situation or highlight an environmental effect. Many players will probably end up remembering a couple of these set piece battles like when you have to fight your way through what seems like a never ending horde of darkspawn on a bridge in the dark roads, the fire room in the elven ruins that is filled with traps and archer skeletons, and finally the ambush where you end up meeting Zevron and have to deal with archers surrounding you on all sides. These set piece battles aren't necessarily supposed to really challenge the player's party, but they do at least make you sit up in your chair and actually pay attention to combat for a little bit. Finally, the game presents the player with a boss battle at the end of almost every single quest line as you basically have to prove right by might and accomplish the mission by killing the big baddie. What's interesting about these fights is that it's almost never just a one monster boss, as every single villain ends up calling in reinforcements at some point in the fight. The pride demon at the top of the mage tower tries to turn the mages into abominations unless you use a quest item to stop him mid-battle. The Karta mob boss calls in reinforcements every time she goes invisible as you try to stop your characters from walking through her traps around the room. The Darkspawn Matron has an unlimited number of tentacles that come to her aid, as well as several eight waves of gunlocks and hurlocks just to throw at you. And even the final boss of the game is supported by an entire army of lesser Darkspawn that you're supposed to combat with your own forces of goodness. Then, to add on to that second layer of difficulty, many of the bosses throw in another mechanic on top of just killing them, like trying to keep the elven keeper from killing the spirit of the forest while you're fighting him, or using the ballista around the archdemon to do heavy damage when he flies away. And all of this sounds really cool when I talk about it, like a fight from your weekly D&D session, but the fact is that they all end up just feeling exactly the same. I ended up fighting the ogre at the end of Ostagar the same way I fought the pride demon, the same way I fought the golem paragon, the same way I fought the final boss, because all of these story mobs are immune to most of the unique spell effects like petrification, freeze, and blood control that your options become really limited when fighting them, and you're basically forced into thinking about the best ways to heal your character instead of the best ways to hurt the boss. These epic final scenes to each storyline end up making the player focus on the ads that join the boss or the unique mechanics they add to the arena because the most you can really do to most of these enemies is auto attack them and time your heals or potions for best effect. Despite the fact that combat comprises around 30% of total gameplay time on average, there really isn't that much more to say about it all. The game does make some monsters feel interesting by giving them a special ability like webs for spiders, battle cries for darkspawn, and stunning shots for archers, but the majority of the monsters in the game are just as simple-minded as picking a target and trying to auto-attack them. The only real mobs in the game that spice up life in any real sense are the enemy mages in the game that have access to around 5 spells or so, but those are also the mobs that I was most likely to target down the fastest at the beginning of any fight so that I wouldn't have to deal with them in the first place. Added to this, the threat system in the game is simple enough that I never really struggled maintaining target priorities on my tank since all you have to do is toggle the threatening sword and board stance and suddenly enemies will only target your mages if you're trying to burst them down, at which point they're already about to be dead. 
Some battles try to fluff up the gameplay by putting archers along hard to reach ledges or having doors open up mid battle to add more enemies, but the vast majority of the combat is comprised of very simple turn and burn encounters where you CC some key targets and auto attack your way through the rest. And like I mentioned with the difficulty settings, the true challenge behind the game is learning how to build an efficient party instead of actually positioning on even the hardest game settings. Because of all this, I ended up getting really bored with the combat about halfway through the game when I realized that every battle ended up playing out the same for me. Mana clash the mages, crushing prison the elites, blood wound the pack, and then repeat with CC chains on the next mage in my party until everything is dead. I really have to get frustrated with it when things go wrong because only a couple of encounters in the entire game are capable of killing your party if you build them right. The overhead camera is less of an important tool like it was in the CRPGs because if you have to resort to pinpoint positioning during most battles, then you're probably doing something wrong. These combat problems end up following Origins into its DLCs as well, so if the CC focus combat doesn't float your fancy, then things aren't going to end up getting much better in the additional combat. What is interesting about the 8 major DLC packs that come with the ultimate edition of the game is their nature as early exploration into the Bioware DLC options that the company uses today. The first three DLC packs that end up affecting the main storyline are Warden's Keep, The Stone Prisoner, and Return to Ostgar, which all last about an hour each, so it's not too much of a detour if you decide to explore their locations at any point in the main story. The Warden's Keep follows the story of a young merchant who is trying to reclaim the hold of his noble house that fell into ruin after the events of a failed coup. Ironically, this DLC probably should have been a part of the base game, since it does a good job establishing reasons why the people of Ferelden seem to be so wary of the Grey Wardens, as you explore the history behind the political takeover that the Wardens conceived of 200 years ago. Sadly, this DLC focuses on establishing a plausible home base area for the character to call their own instead of focusing on the rationale behind their coup that might have served as an explanation for Loghain's behavior. But instead of establishing an in-game representation of Loghain's distrust, the story of Warden's Keep focuses on clearing the keep out from all the demons in the area so that you could plausibly use it as a base of operations in the future. But then, like every other origin storyline, once you leave the area, there's absolutely no reason to feel like going back to the area after the fact. As I was leaving to return to the main story, I fiddled with the idea of returning after a couple of quests to see if any new merchants ended up entering the area, and if you keep the magical researcher working for you, I've heard you can gain access to a special skill. But then, I realized that none of that really felt like it mattered, and I quickly forgot about the experience as a whole. The DLC could have possibly drawn some importance to the base building idea behind the keep by using this as the gathering point for the armies at the end of the story instead of Redcliffe, but that probably would have required this section of the game to be a part of the base campaign in the first place. Kind of a meh DLC that could have been amazing with only a couple of tweaks. The second main campaign DLC of Real Note is Return to Ostagar, which is also an hour-long dungeon crawl as you explore the ruins of Ostagar where the king's army filled at the beginning of the game. Perhaps the most interesting element from the area is the use of the environment to convey a sense of time and growth that is decidedly lacking from the rest of the game. Since the majority of the areas you go to are only ever visited once, there's no real way for the player to see them change over time or even reflect any of the changes that you made during the main quests, other than seeing Denerim going up in flames in the final gameplay sequence. So by simply covering the Ostagar ruins with a layer of snow, it's a more profound environmental change than you would expect from just a simple palette swap. The snow also helps the DLC take on a dark undertone as you explore the area and find the body of the king crucified almost as a warning to any humans that may pass through the area. While you're debating what to do with the body, a Genlock necromancer ends up showing up who you have to track down and kill before you can put the king's body to rest. 
This combat section also introduces the idea of a new enemy type with minion monsters that only take one hit from any source in order to kill, and help the section develop the idea that the darkspawn are an unlimited swarm while you wade through rank after rank of the vermin. Evidently, Bioware ended up liking this implementation of swarm monsters in the game since it ended up becoming a much more commonly used mechanic in the sequel Dragon Age 2, but it's always fun to see developers use DLC sections to test out their new ideas before putting it into a mainline entry. So after you take care of all the darkspawn in the area and get the king's body, I was hit with an odd feeling of unease about the whole situation since this is the only real time in the game that the darkspawn ended up displaying a sense of higher intelligence. The fact that they were not only able to recognize the human king by his golden armor, but they were also able to strip him and crucify the body as a message to their enemies is much more involved thought than you would expect from zombie orcs that aren't supposed to be capable of rational long-term planning. A smart little indication of the direction Origins decides to take going forward with the Awakening DLC. The final DLC integrated into the main story revolves around the introduction of a new companion character named Shale that happens to be a golem that's been suspended in place for several decades due to the termination of her prior owner. So you buy a golem control rod off a random merchant and travel to a small village overrun with darkspawn only to realize that the merchant gave you the wrong safe word to wake up the golem. After some exploration around the area, you end up finding a house protecting the survivors of the village with a force field just powerful enough to keep the darkspawn at bay until you came along. You're quickly pressured into taking care of another child being controlled by a desire demon or I guess it's a talking cat this time, but same general concept as you either deal with the demon for a personal game or banish it back to the fade through brute force. I know it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but this DLC also included one of those move one square at a time, make a path type of puzzles, and I didn't totally hate it, so I guess that's kind of cool. Thankfully, Bioware didn't end up going too stir-crazy with puzzles in their games and only implemented a couple more once Inquisition came out nearly a decade later. So you save the little girl, find the safe word in the dead mage's notes, free the townsfolk, and finally get to meet Shale, possibly the most entertaining golem I've ever had the opportunity to meet. Her primary character trait includes hating mages because one of them used to own her as a slave, as well as hating pigeons after being shit on for a couple of decades in the middle of a village by random birds. I would actually prefer to use her as a warrior companion over Alistair, but Shale also comes with a mechanic where all of her armor types are filled by only a single equipment slot, and all of her weapons are filled by a sing second equipment slot, both of which can only be filled by a specific type of gemstone that are exceedingly rare in the game. The problem with this is that the warrior's best quality is their ability to make use of gear that the mages in your party might not find useful, so when the gear dependent class is given restrictions that make a specific companion much harder to actually use compared to the others, it's a mess that I don't think I could put myself through unless I played through the game on one of the easier difficulties. The DLC companion also unlocks a companion quest where I would assume you can find some better gemstones for the character, but those unlock requirements bring us to the reason that I haven't really touched on any of the companion stories up until this point. From the way that everyone talks about them, the companion side quests sound like they're some really good character moments that make the companions feel like real people. Unfortunately, I've had to refer to these storylines in the hypothetical because I never ended up seeing any of that brilliance. Sure, the banter between Morgan and Alistair is pretty scathing as you explore the world, and every key choice your companions make sure that you know how they feel about it all, but then nothing usually comes out of it unless you specifically seek them out to talk to them in the campsite every once in a while. The problem with this is the fact that when you first get access to the companions, you may end up exhausting all of their dialogue options in camp with nothing really gained from the waste of time. Instead, you need to 
check specific approval rating triggers in order for the companion to like you well enough to actually trust you and give you the companion quest that actually develops the character. If you fail to get those approval ratings up through the natural gameplay flow, you'll have the chance to essentially buy their love by purchasing unlimited quantities of gift type items that you can give to the NPCs. And after all of this, I might have been on board with the idea if the implementation behind gift giving wasn't so stubborn, requiring the player to first select the character they want to give the gift to, then open the inventory, then right click the radial menu over the item gift option and suffer a short dialogue exchange as your approval rating goes up. All of which needs to be done from a section of the game outside of the campground since you can't select the other characters in the one place it would be the most convenient to try giving them gifts. So after realizing all of this nonsense and hoops I would have to go through just to even try and trigger the companion quests, I decided that wasn't worth my time. Maybe I'm being petty, but I never really cared about the companions in Origins since they never invite you to explore their dark pasts until after you've practically stuck your nose all the way up their ass. It doesn't matter how interesting a character's backstory might be if you've never been given any reason to believe that something interesting is going on behind the scenes in the first place. Why did I care enough about Loghain's backstory enough to read about everything that happened to him outside of the game? because his actions and justifications made no sense without the larger context of his character development. So with just a couple hints and illusions behind the scene, I was inspired to even go outside of the game world and explore the fictional literature on his character in a way that Alistair and Gwen were never able to intrigue me despite spending the entire game with them. The one exception to this rule of characters not giving me the chance to start their companion quests was Morrigan, who I think I may have stumbled into her quest by pure mistake when I found a black grimoire and gave it to her because it seemed fitting. She told me that she would try to study it for a couple of days, at which point she approached me with a request to confront her mother the next time I came back to camp. So maybe I just happened to have a good enough approval rating with Morgan compared to the other characters, so she approached me on her own merit, but at least it was something. So I traveled off to meet her mother once again, who revealed that she does indeed take up the bodies of her children every once in a while, before presenting the player with an option to take the grimoire that Morgan wants as long as they let Flemeth run free. Since I had to go to the area without Morgan in the party to trigger the event, I wasn't much in the mood to fight Dragon Flemeth, so I took her bargain and walked away with the grimoire to the mild approval of Morgan, and that's basically it. Morgan is still definitely the same person that you first met her, and her worldville hasn't really changed. And while the player now knows a little bit about her family life, there's not really too much you can do with a questline that only lasts 10 minutes max. There was no real divine realization that made me rethink everything I knew about her character, and this is certainly not the pinnacle of character writing that Bioware has to offer. The best I can give it is that at least it inspired all the future games from the developer to focus more on these companion stories, making it a key feature in their games going forward instead of the awkward quest giving by your love minigame that it is in Origins. The real nail in the coffin for this companion quest system is that I never felt interested enough to actually put in the effort to wade my way through the gift system to the content I knew was hidden behind it. Regardless of how complicated the game system is, a player can always metagame their way through the stuff that they don't like if there's something worthwhile on the other side, like in the case of Dragon Age Inquisition where they also locked the companion quests behind exhausting all of the dialogue options before they would even bother telling you about their problems. The difference between the two games that made me go through the hassle in Inquisition but not Origins was the fact that I actually cared about the companions as unique and interesting characters even before their backstories were developed upon with quests. While the companions in Origins have always seemed like dull or archetypes for me, the naive noble, the cunning witch, the wise crone, the drunken dwarf, the stoic zealot the shadowy sister, the orphaned assassin, and finally the ironic golem. 
they aren't necessarily bad characters, but I never felt the need to dive through jank in order to get to know them better. So going back to the discussion about Dragon Age Origins DLCs, I enjoyed the hour of gameplay that I received via the Stone Prisoner content, but between the lack of good gearing options that I encountered for Shale, as well as the problems that I ran into with companion quests across Origins, I simply accepted the fact that I would only experience the DLC section as a decently paced short story pack. This marks the final DLC that actually linked to the main story, at which point we need to start addressing the out-of-campaign story DLCs like the well-known campaign epilogue named Dragon Age Awakening. This 8 hour long mini campaign directly follows the events of Origins and the death of the Archdemon and even allows the players to directly import their character from the main campaign into this epilogue since the level bracket follows the typical level 20 character that you'll complete the main campaign with. As such, this is the equivalent of a Throne of Ball epic level character quest where your warden now happens to be the commander of the Grey in the Ferelden Kingdom, trying to deal with wiping out the last remnants of Darkspawn from the Fifth Blight. This conflict starts to get a little bit more interesting when the player discovers that the Darkspawn in the area not only happen to be developing a sense of intelligence and self-awareness, but also appear to be participating in a civil war between two parties. We're introduced to this story as the MC returns to Vigil's Keep, the ancestral home of the noble Howe family that was summarily dismantled when you killed the Terran during the main campaign. Right before you arrive at the Keep, they suffered a brutal attack from Darkspawn that burrowed in through underground tunnels and ambushed the castle. Of course, you fight your way through the Keep, saving several characters that will set up shop in this hub after the battle is complete, until you finally encounter the leader behind the salt a fully talking Darkspawn. After a quick spurt of dialogue, you're forced to murder the intelligent Darkspawn without really learning anything of value, at which point all the people you saved crawl out from their holes and turn the place into a semi-interesting home base for the expansion. It's mostly just an allusion to a player-controlled housing than an actually customizable area because there's not really all that much you can actually do with the keep. You have a handful of advisors who give you the three main quests behind the DLC and everyone in the keep refers to as commander, but the only real things that I could find that affect the area in any way was a dwarf who you can pay to make the wall strong, and a blacksmith that you can give ore to in order to improve the equipment of your soldiers. And if either of those improvements to the keep had any visual ramifications on the area, it was definitely lost on me because at best, the keep only served as a well-stocked quest hub for the campaign, in my eyes. Once again, Origins is hinting at the idea that they wanted to develop a player housing area, but it comes across so stark in its design that it never really accomplishes anything special that couldn't be done with just the quest hub that it seems like it actually is. So after liberating Vigil's Keep, you're set on your quest to go explore three main locations where Darkspawn have been seen around the area in order to try and put a stop to the attacks. The section I decided to tackle first was a trip to the Wending Wood, where merchant caravans have started to go missing. Once you arrive, you'll discover that several groups of human mercenaries are fighting with an elven keeper named Vilana, who has turned the woods into a bad place to be a non-elf. After some exploring, the player will discover that Velana believes that a group of humans murdered her entire clan, and as a result, she started to wreak havoc on any human merchants that passed through the area in retribution. But after some more detective work, the player will discover that the darkspawn in the area have been posing as humans in order to intentionally cause this conflict between the elves and the humans in the area something that neither side would assume was possible since there's never been intelligent darkspawn before this point. You're then given a half choice between recruiting Vilana to the party and outright killing her, which always seemed like a weird inclusion in Bioware games. Whenever I'm presented with the option of not picking up a companion, I feel compelled to recruit them regardless of whether I feel strongly about them or not, because you never know what options that might end up unlocking later in the game. 
Origins might be a bad example of this, since all of the companions are utilized in such a bare-bones way compared to later entries in the catalog, but even in this unique situation, it's still worth picking up any companions you might find along the way, since they end up being used whenever the main character isn't currently at the location of conflict. This happens once during the Battle of Denerim, when the front gates are attacked while the main character is deep in the city, and is heavily alluded to in Dragon Age Awakening when your companions you don't take with you in the final quest will defend Vigil's Keep without you. Either way, I've never been the type of person to just refuse a companion on my first interaction with them, since there's always a chance that they actually are written into a tragic backstory which redeems their character over the course of the game. Or at least that's the case for the sequel for, to All Origins. In this game, you're going to want to accept all the possible friends you might come across because you might randomly need to use them for non-foreshadowed split party content at a moment's notice. And that particular instance where your random group of leftover companions have to guard the gate at Denerim is peak annoyance in all of my playthroughs. So now that you've most likely just recruited Velana, the party decides to go explore the nearby mines and find the darkspawn that tricked the humans and elves into fighting, at which point you walk into a conveniently placed sleeping ward. Now that I think about it in retrospective, it, it's really weirdly easy for the villains throughout the series to just put your main characters to sleep with hardly any effort, and then consistently fail to finish you off like they just expect you to become their sleeping beauty. Either way, the giant forehead Darkspawn takes you deeper into his experimentation lab, and after an indeterminate time behind bars, a weird girl with clouded eyes that appears to be serving the Darkspawn comes and frees you. It was only near the end of the DLC that I realized this girl was supposed to be the elf sister to Velana that disappeared during the Darkspawn attacks, because she always looked like a dwarf to me for some reason. I'll come back to her character later because she makes very little sense in the larger plot of things, but we don't have any context for why she makes no sense until the end of the DLC. So you're freed from captivity, stripped of all your gear and potions, and basically tasked with exploring the dungeon in order to get back all your stuff, which runs a fine line between making it a memorable sequence and frustrating the hell out of me for no reason. I'm not sure if the relief I felt when finally getting back all my potions at the end of the dungeon was worth it since half the time I was stressed out about the possibility that I had just left it all in a corner of the dungeon that I hadn't explored by that point. But after retrieving all your stuff and meeting a Kunari merchant that is weirdly cool with trading with at Necroworks, you finally catch up with Darth Forehead who appears to unleash two mini dragons on your party then watches the whole thing go down before walking through a hole in the wall and causing a cave in to stop you from following him. This section also makes even less sense as you get further in the game, like just about everything to do with Darth Forehead. So you've defeated all the darkspawn in the elven woods and solved the problem of the disappearing merchants, all while learning very little other than a vague notion that Forehead is somehow making darkspawn sentient. At this point, I ended up tracking down the last known location of a warden who was hunting darkspawn in the Black Marsh area around the old haunted mansion. You never actually end up going into the mansion, but a weird haunting presence infects the area and has been keeping away settlers for the last couple decades. This area also happens to be the first time you'll end up meeting the darkspawn larvae monsters that the game refers to as childers. Like a witcher, but with the word child. Childer is a weird word that I am thankful didn't catch on in the same way, since these things mutate into even more grotesque forms when they devour other darkspawn. Thankfully, the darkspawn presence in the marsh is pretty light, so you only have to deal with the larvae form of the monsters here. I'd like to imagine that the Codex has a really cool backstory for why these darkspawn are so different from the others, but the actual explanation is that they're just a rare breed of herlocks. Which I thought was kind of boring, considering they're a cannibal insectoid race, but whatever. So while exploring the marsh, you'll end up coming across the dead body of the warden you were following to the area, at which point the darkspawn will launch an ambush on your party, led by an intelligent herlock named The First. 
He claims to be a servant of the Mother, sent to give you aid against the evil Darkspawn controlled by the Father. Weird family problems, but okay. Even before you can try to refuse the gift, the group of you are sent to the Fade by a mysterious spell. The first is just as surprised as you are by the Mother's betrayal that was only supposed to trap the Wardens in the Spirit Realm, but instead of allying with you, he runs off to find his own way out of the situation. So once again, the player is trapped in the Fade, maybe for the fourth time depending on your choices earlier in Origins, and you have to find your way back out. I haven't touched much about the Fade up until this point, and that's because Origins and DA2 do a really bad job of conveying the importance of the Fade in the world's construction. It's only once you get far enough into the story of Inquisition and start to understand what the Fade actually is, that it starts to take more importance. So the best way to think of it is as a dream realm at this point in the series. Essentially, this Fade Realm is the home of creatures called demons that represent the cardinal sins like pride, desire, sloth, and rage, but also a group of spirits that represent the best parts of humanity like justice, valor, faith, and hope. Throughout the series, the cardinal sin variety are much more prevalent in your interactions with the Fade since most of the benevolent spirits end up getting tainted by their interactions with the mortal realm. We actually get to see this happen as you meet a spirit of justice halfway through your trip out of the Fade. Apparently, the Countess that used to rule this land was such a cruel mistress to the common folk that they rose up and burned her mansion to the ground along with her in it, despite the fact the mansion is still standing in real life somehow. Anyways, with her dying breath, she cursed the village, pulling everybody she could with her into the Fade so that she could torment them for all time. Eventually, she became so prideful and vengeful that she either became a pride demon or was replaced by a pride demon without the villagers really noticing the difference as their eternal torment continued on. So after feeling their pain, the spirit of justice came to the villagers' defense and battered down the mansion gates along with your help to confront the Baroness directly. It's suddenly revealed that it's going to be a fight between your party and justice, against the Baroness and the First, who threw his law in with the Pride Demon in order to earn his freedom from her realm. And after quickly defeating the First, the Baroness tears a hole in the Fade in order to try and escape your assault, letting you free in the process. In her haste, she mistakenly released both herself and Justice into the real world, at which point Justice ends up taking control of the dead body of the Warden you were following in the first place. After escaping the Fade, your group quickly tracks down the Baroness and defeats her in the Pride Demon form, leaving the Black Marsh in a state of relative peace now that the source of the haunting is gone. Like with the Velana situation, you can choose to either accept Justice's help or refuse his companionship for the rest of the game, which is a real shame because he's one of the most interesting companions in Origins as a whole and one of the most important characters in the series, as we'll soon learn. Justice is unique in that he's the only long-term companion you can have in the Dragon Age series that is actually from the spirit realm instead of the mortal realm, and this gives us a unique perspective on the progression of spirits over time. While you were trapped in the Fade, his goal was so simple and guided by the needs of the trapped villagers that any question of justice was black and white and easy to define. But now that you're back in the real world and he's inhabiting the body of a dead man, Justice receives a few of the memories of the Grey Warden and his purpose to defeat the Darkspawn in defense of humanity. A purpose that Justice now takes up for himself as a self-righteous orc slayer. And while this might not be too interesting in your average fantasy setting, the whole build-up around Awakening focuses on the growing self-consciousness of the Darkspawn hordes and what appears to be a new species of sentient creatures. The main storyline was implied to be a simple struggle between the races of good and an unmistakably evil force, but now that those same zombie orcs are starting to think for themselves, it all takes on a different context. It's in this context where the evil hordes are suddenly personified that the actions of a righteous creature like Justice seem all the more vehement and ill-meaning. From what I could tell, his mindset never changed when he left the Fade, but the context of the world around him where humans and elves and dwarves all operate on different levels of moral grey didn't allow for simple answers between white and black. 
Justice inherited the memories of a man who fought against the Darkspawn, and so he took that pre predisposition to an extreme and now believes that Darkspawn are the ultimate evil that must be purged from the world. And the only distinction between justice and vengeance is the perspective of the speaker in relation to the victim, so now that justice has been pulled into the body of a victim of the Darkspawn, there's no way he could ever enact justice on the Darkspawn without also becoming vengeance. The Awakening DLC does a wonderful job gradually spinning up the cogs in the player's head as you're slowly introduced to both sides of the Darkspawn on their apparent civil war. And now that the player is left with the last task of the DLC before the climax, the Darkspawn infighting will become even more apparent. Your party now makes its way to the, the Knotwood Hills, where a massive rift in the ground has begun swarming with Darkspawn, indicating that it might just be a spawning ground. After some initial exploration, the player might be able to realize that the ruins unearthed by the crevice also happen to be dwarven architecture in their typical obsession with granite and geometric sculptures. It turns out that this darkspawn breeding ground used to be the great dwarven taig of Calharol that fell under the darkspawn siege during the first blight several hundred years ago. Since then, it appears to have become a center of reproduction for the Darkspawn, as no less than three broodmothers have set up shop in the lower levels of the fortress. The Wardens realize what must be done to stop the flow of Darkspawn in the area, and set about clearing their way through waves of Darkspawn that actually appear to be fighting each other more than their concern with the player. As you progress through room after room of infighting, you'll eventually encounter the leader of the defending Darkspawn, who happens to be in control of a giant lava golem. While the fight itself is rather simple, the implications that these newly sentient Darkspawn are smart enough that they can control the dwarven golems is truly concerning since there's no telling what other machinations of the dwarves are hidden far below the surface. But upon defeating this Darkspawn leader, you'll find the Brood Mothers conveniently placed directly below a giant Lyrium Bomb that will quickly solve all your problems before you return to the surface. Now that you're near the end of the Awakening campaign, the storylines start to look a little bit less interesting in retrospect. In order to stop the merchant attacks in the Elven Forest, you just killed the Darkspawn in Forehead's Lavatory before he runs away. To stop the haunting of Black March, the Darkspawn conveniently trapped you in the Fade, allowing you to deal with the demon that caused all the problems in the first place, and the player quickly puts an end to the breeding camps in Kalharal by dropping a one-ton block of magical dynamite on their heads as you cut your way through a civil war. Along the way, you'll meet a vengeful elf, a spirited corpse, and a cowardly dwarf, but their stories all begin and end in the area that you found them, so I never felt a need to give a summary of the dwarf's backstory despite accepting her as an eventual companion. And despite all this simplicity and railroading, I genuinely enjoyed the plot of Awakening because it has more to do with the context and world building that the section of the game provides than the actual story baits. There's no real twists in the story because everything in the DLC is so well foreshadowed that any player that's half paying attention will be able to see what's coming long before it happens. No, Awakening succeeded in a way that Origin's story was never able to do for me because the villain in this story was finally presented as a conscious participant in events, in a way that the unthinking hordes of evil trope was never able to make me interested. It's when these zombie orcs started to act and register in my brain as a closer relative to orcs than to zombies that the base morality of even acting as a Grey Warden starts to fall under pressure. The idea behind this is that killing a rabid bear is a very different conflict than it is to kill a human. No matter whether both groups are trying to kill you, the assumption is that the human might have a valid reason to want to do it, while the bear is simply acting on instinct. These questions grew stronger and stronger in my mind the further I got into the DLC, especially as we progress into the final stage of the campaign where one of the Darkspawn factions decides to attack the city of Amaranthine. In a similar situation to the Darkspawn invasion during the main game, your characters find out about the attacks far too late and are forced to catch up to the Darkspawn forces after they've already broken through the main city walls. 
In order to get to this point in the game, the player would have at least had to do a cursory jaunt around the city as you were tracking down the whereabouts of the warden that went to the Black Marsh. But that section of the DLC felt so reminiscent of the purposeless fetch quests in Denerim that I ignored the 30 minutes of gameplay it takes to complete your first trip to Amaranthine before this point. Either way, the player is already reasonably familiar with the layout of the area and may recognize some of the faces that are under attack by the Darkspawn, but your first impressions of the city were most likely so shallow after only about an hour of gameplay at max that it never really pulls off the same feeling of despair or anger that the player may have experienced at the burning of Denerim. I can see how they tried to produce a similar effect, but by this point in the game I was so done with the washed out brown hues of the Origins game world that the fires around the city actually struck me as kind of lively compared to the usual. So you're fighting your way into the city when a Darkspawn messenger arrives to tell you about a separate attack on Vigil's Keep. He claims to be a servant of the Architect, and you can even recruit his help as an ally character if you decide to stay in Amaranthine instead of going back to help defend the Keep. This is the moment where any effort you put into rebuilding Vigil's Keep actually comes into play so that even if you put in a minimal amount of work into strengthening the castle, you can stay in Amaranthine without worrying about the keep failing without your help. While I personally only did two quests pertaining to the keep, paying 80 gold to a dwarven merchant to strengthen the walls and telling the blacksmiths about where to find more raw materials for their arms and armor, and apparently those two quests that might have taken three minutes of my time in total were enough to make the keep into an impregnable fortress. Even though the effort you need to put in to make the keep defensible is pretty negligible, there's no way you could know that for sure on your first playthrough of the DLC, which allows the choice to retain its narrative sense of consequence as you decide between saving the city or the keep. If you do decide to save the city, it's as simple as killing five packs of darkspawn in a ring around the town center, then going underground to the smugglers caves and doing the same thing with another five packs of darkspawn. They were understandably limited by the size of the amaranthine area in comparison to Denerim's multi-location sprawl, but I was still genuinely surprised when the siege was at its end since it had felt like it had only just started and I thought there were several days left of attacks to go through. I think the problem the game runs into here is that they heavily imply that another wave is going to attack the city at any point, but that plot point is kind of just forgotten after you finish clearing out the smugglers caves that the darkspawn have been using to sneak in. Either way, once you've defeated the Darkspawn Assault, a scout will notify you that they've found the home base that all the Darkspawn attacks seem to be coming from, at which point the Architect's Delegate mentions that you'll find both Darth Forehead and the Mother there since they both wish to kill each other just as much as you do. The area that you end up exploring once you get there is actually pretty fitting for the highest level area in the game as you explore this bleak, burned landscape surrounded by bones of ancient dragons as you wade your way through rank upon rank of darkspawn. After fighting another dragon at the end of this area that should have absolutely nothing to do with the darkspawn in the area but is still aggressive for some reason, you make your way down the tower into the mother's inner lair. As you travel through the flesh-lined halls of this ancient elven ruin and encounter more and more adult childers that must have been feeding on the darkspawn in the area, the scene is set for the end of Dragon Age Origins. The area is so uniquely grotesque in its embrace of darkspawn styling decisions, almost surpassing the initial reveal that darkspawn used corrupted females to spawn more of their kind. So it is that we finally meet the architect face to face and have the opportunity to have a genuine conversation with the creature that reveals much of the backstory behind this DLC. It turns out that Darkspawn can imbibe the blood of Grey Wardens in order to inherit their resistance to the taint and regain some semblance of self-identity back from the old gods. If the player exhibits some sense of horror at the idea that Darkspawn are specifically targeting Grey Wardens in order to drink their blood, the Architect brings up the counterpoint that it's not really all that different from what the Wardens do in the joining. 
Both sides of the coin have proven they're capable of intelligent thought, so what permits the surface races to murder Darkspawn in cold blood but not the other way around when both sides need the other in order to attain a higher level of self? The architect also claims that the first time you both met, he intended to have a friendly conversation in his lab but was unable to due to the circumstances, which unfortunately never made sense to me since he's the one that sicked his dragons on you and then caused a cave-in to run away. He also justifies his actions taking Grey Warden blood in order to appraise his fellow Darkspawn by bringing up the fact that he would prefer to use the blood of willing Grey Wardens like the blind dwarf woman that follows him around in just about every cutscene. But this dwarfing Grey Warden and Velana's sister both appear to have gone blind or otherwise developed some really weird cataracts since working for the architect, but both of them can see just fine in a weird visual choice that I don't think is ever explained in the actual game. These are only the highlights from your discussion from the architect, but the general feel from the conversation is the plight of this darkspawn scientist asking for your help to defeat the mother and then bring his darkspawn brethren deeper into the undergrounds to experiment in peace. Up until playing the DLC, I assume my answer to his alliance would be a resounding no, because the darkspawn have always been described as pure evil throughout the game. But after hearing the context for everything and experiencing the violent but justified thought process of the intelligent darkspawn, I found myself agreeing with the architect's request, perhaps specifically because this is the origin story of a possible orc race for the Dragon Age world, which is such a fantastic idea that I can't help but hope that the developers end up taking it in this direction one day. Ironically, at the end of this conversation, you have to talk down justice from attacking the architect, with or without your help, since he cannot see Darkspawn as anything other than a taint upon the world, perhaps marking the most outright evidence of justice's incapability to parse through a world of moral grey, thus making him just about as aggressive and single-natured as the Darkspawn typically are in a fitting moment of role reversal. These moments of characterization are so rare in Dragon Age Origins, but when they do foreshadow the path the games would end up taking, it's just absolutely beautiful. So now that you've enlisted the aid of the architect against the matron, you make your final trek through the flesh-covered ruins to her final lair. Similar to the representation of Loghain during the main game, throughout Awakening you're introduced to the mother's character by seeing out of character interactions between the mother and her servants as you're traveling between main locations on the map screen. This handful of expository scenes do a really good job of establishing the fact that the mother is absolutely nuts before you ever even meet her in the first place, and your discussion with her before the final battle is just as enlightening. Apparently, some Darspawn react very negatively when the architect frees them from the taint, since they can no longer hear the sweet song that kept them from going insane with the pain that first made them into the monsters that they are now, as in the case of the Broodmothers. Despite her growing insanity, she still tries to test your faith in the architect by bringing up the fact that he was once the cause of the fifth blight, since he had attempted to give the old god Erthemiel Grey Warden blood in order to make him immune to the taint and permanently stop the blights. But now it's too late for second guessing your allies either way, so battle begins and it's basically just another brood mother fight, but with slightly more adds after each wave compared to the first time you fought a mother. The main character sets the mother on fire and walks away into the camera as you finally end the Dragon Age Origins main story. Or it would be the end if there weren't another four DLC packs that come with the Dragon Age Origins Ultimate Edition. After playing through them all myself for this retrospective, I can understand why most other critics kind of just ignore this mini-story thing, since most of them aren't really that interesting. In the Darkspawn Chronicle, you get to play as a Darkspawn Herlock Captain that leads an A-team group of ogres, freaks, emissaries, and minor Darkspawn to victory against the forces of Denerim in an alternate universe where Alistair was the only warden that survived Ostgar. It's kind of fun, it's got some cool alternate universe codex entries, playing as the Darkspawn definitely feels different than your normal party play, and 
at least for my mage heavy parties and it's just kind of a hour-long what-if scenario that never really goes anywhere. Likewise, the Golems of Amgarok DLC follows the story of a group of dwarves that went to a center for golem technology, the Lost Taig of Amgarak, in order to reclaim more technology. Ultimately, it seems that they weren't content to simply reclaim the traditional golem technology, and so they set about making the very first flesh golems with the help of a Tevinter mage that had come along on their expedition. They eventually succeed to the point that this flesh golem detaches its head after the mage trapped a spirit in its body and then fled to the hidden corners of the taig. As such, the DLC is a mix of an alien type of scenario as you keep getting glimpses of the creature that seems to be playing with you at every turn. While you try to undo the dwarven puzzle the expedition used to trap the creature in the taig, Eventually, you end up confronting the creature before declaring the tide cleansed of the experimental mistake and make your way out of the area, only for the game to reveal that there were many, many more harvesters that the hero Ferelden never even knew about. This is such a poorly developed threat to the world order and relatively unknown due to the number of people that actually played the DLC that I can't help but hope it never comes up as a main conflict in later games because in practice it just comes off as more of a gag reel than a genuine world canon event. Similarly, the Song of Leliana follows the story of Dragon Age's favorite side character before she joined the Chantry, but prior to the events of Dragon Age Origins. Supposedly, she was a member of a small thieving group that were hired by the Orlesians to do some sabotage in the middle of Denerim, mostly just playing some benign tricks on the nobles in the area. That is, up until the point where the leader of your little group, named Marjolaine, puts you on a job placing some incriminating documents in the house of one of the Ferelden nobles, a task that could even cause a war between the Orlesians and the Ferelden's if the wrong person found out. Understandably, Leliana isn't too pleased with the plan due to the fact that their group could be charged with treason if they were ever caught, so they try to go back in and undo their own work to fix the sol situation when they're betrayed by Marjolaine. After spending a couple days being tortured in the nobles' dungeons, a Chantry mother helps free the rogue by conveniently dropping a key into her cell so that their crew can break out and get revenge on Marjolaine. You quickly track her down to a forsaken coastline and kill all the men under the command of the noble she sold you out to before the final confrontation between the women. Marjolaine reveals that she knew you were going to betray her one day because that's what she would do. So she jumped the gun and betrayed Leliana first so that she wouldn't be the one caught off guard by the situation. This places Leliana in a sticky situation where if she kills Marjolaine, it makes her no better than her former leader, but if she lets Marjolaine free, the Warman claims she will hunt Leliana for the rest of her life. The game ends up addressing this terrible choice by cutting to black and saying the end result never really mattered, only that Leliana is now devoted to the church to make up for her mistakes that she made earlier in life while in the underground. Surprisingly, I was okay with this ending and actually thought it was kind of a cool way of letting Leliana stay her own character without taking the control out of the player's hands while controlling her avatar over the course of this DLC. It would have been far too easy for the developers to let the player make that final choice on her behalf at the end of the DLC, but if they had done that, then Leliana would cease to be her own story and would instead become a factor of the player's story in a way that the developers didn't want to let happen. Finally, we're presented with the last DLC with any real plotline significance in Witch Hunt, another hour-long story where the hero of Herelden is trying to hunt down Morrigan after scouts have recently claimed to see her in the Kakari wilds again. Your reason for wanting to find Morrigan is never really explained in any detail, so you kind of just influence the connotations of your pursuit based on the dialogue options you pick, between wanting to hunt her down and wanting to just talk to an old friend again. The thing is, the DLC is kind of just a random time sink as you join up with some shallow side characters with 15 minutes of total screen time as you do a romp through several areas you've already explored in the main game, like a best moments montage of all the settings in the game. 
The best example of this is the fact that you spend at least 5 to 10 minutes of the game looking up books in a, the circle library using an actual in-world library index. A game mechanic that feels dated only 10 years later and will probably confuse any younger players as manual index catalogs become more and more rare every year. As such, you run through the elven ruins from the Dalish origin story, explore the reliquary in the circle basement, search for some old lanterns in the dwarven taig, and finally return to the dragon graveyard that you explored at the end of Awakenings. The coolest part of the whole sequence is that the final boss of the DLC happens to be a Vartaral, an ancient elven creation used to guard the most precious elven artifacts over the millennia, as they serve as basically the equivalent to elven golems in their ability to revive so long as the object they're protecting still exists. So after fighting this giant dragon spider looking thing, you finally catch up to Morgan who has found a working alluvian behind the corpse of the mother using literally the same arena as the battle from Awakening. So obviously this DLC isn't well known because it takes you to new places in the world, but the last five minutes or so as you talk with Morgan almost make up for it as she foreshadows several of the conflicts that won't even end up taking shape until the end of the third game in the series. She claims that Flemeth is much more than a simple Witch of the Wilds and is possibly one of the most dangerous entities in the world of Thetis for all the power she holds. Depending on your relationship with Morgan, you can either let her go freely, stab her, or join her as she enters the magic mirror and disappears until halfway through Dragon Age Inquisition. For some players, this is the first real experience they've ever had with the ancient Alluvians, which exist as a type of teleportation network throughout the gnome world, but take an extraordinary amount of knowledge and magical strength to even open the doors in the first place. Thankfully, the series as a whole does a really good job of building up the player's knowledge of these artifacts over time as they progressively get more and more important as you get further into the series. And that, my friends, is the end of Dragon Age Origins and its 8 separate DLCs. While there's technically one more DLC available to the game named A Tale of Orzammar, it's only a short promotional campaign used as a prologue for the Dwarf Noble origin story, and is of relatively little importance, like so many of the other DLCs they made for Origins. In later Dragon Age games, they would go on to focus on longer, more fleshed out storylines for expansion style DLC content, instead of the anthology style that Origins has. A choice which I ended up liking much more than the one hour long focus behind most of the Origins content and how most of their stories never really had the chance to develop any real character of their own other than Awakening. Throughout my discussion on Origins, I was relatively harsh on their storytelling and the magic tricks they end up playing in order to pretend that they had an element of choice behind the story. And perhaps I went too far in my opinions on the subject, it's just that I find a lot of people use those same exact arguments on Dragon Age 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition without acknowledging the fact that Origins was just as flawed in its design. I think it's acceptable to disagree with the design choices behind the sequels, but criticizing their storytelling in the same breath that you put Dragon Age Origins on a marble pedestal seems absolutely insane to me due to the traditional nature of the origin story as a whole. Origins is in fact a very simple story about the races of good fighting against a wave of darkness that can never be communicated with and so must be destroyed by fire and sword. Set out, young traveler, and solve the problem of all the allied races so that they might be free to help you in your time of need, despite the fact that they're all manufactured to present broken societies that cause their own problems in the long term. Yes, I'm being jaded, and yes, this is a gross simplification of all the plot lines, and yes, I was probably influenced by the terrible combat system, but I just can't see why people hold this game like it's the be-all and end-all of RPG design. I personally think it's a pretty good game that you should play if you've got a good 30 hours of free time to spend, but not the type of thing I would tell you to drop all your weekend plans for because you have to experience it for yourself. 
Ironically, I even think the game does a poor job of setting up the background lore behind the series as a whole, since many of the characters in Origins are later revealed to either be terribly ill-informed or simply never had the world experience to formulate the answers to many of the more mysterious phenomena in the game world. Origins was the origin of one of my favorite game series of all time, but that doesn't necessarily make it the most important part of that series. It established a world of humans, dwarves, elves, and necro-orcs in such a traditional Tolkien-esque way, but then threw in just a handful of nuts and bolts to make those stories take a dark turn. Mages can be possessed by demons, elves have been oppressed and enslaved for thousands of years despite their ancient power, the dwarves have been pushed back to their last bastions of safety, the orcs are so blood crazed that only a handful of them out of a million ever gain self-awareness, and even the humans are beset by politics and civil war. Dragon Age presents itself as the grim dark fantasy setting to put just a little bit of edge into every situation, a convenient world building tool that provides ample opportunity for consistent conflict across the series a tool which the sequels would go on to use, portraying a dark and brutal world where everything hangs just on the edge of ruin. But Origins was only the beginning, a first glimpse into a much larger, a much more diverse, and a much more complicated world than just the four main races, to the point where the conflicts that bound the players to the screen in Origins are almost entirely different from the problems that we may be looking at going into Dragon Age 4. Origins is justly named, both as the progenitor for the series, so with its introduction to the world, and even in the grim dark twist on the typical fantasy storyline. It deserves applause for the itch that it filled during a time period where CRPGs were starting to go out of fashion, but it's in retrospect that both Dragon Age 2 and Dragon Age Inquisition end up hitting their marks in a way that Origins just isn't able to do for me anymore. And like Origins, this is only the first video in a three-part series that should all be coming out within a two-week period or so. So if you felt that any of the references fell out of place or I drew your attention to things that seemed unimportant, it's most likely because I'm about to talk about these focuses in the next video about Dragon Age 2. After I wrote the first 70,000 words for this video essay, I realized that it might be a good idea breaking it up into three videos for the sake of helping people load it all faster on their smartphones, as well as organizing it just a little bit better in the grand scheme of things. And the sad part about this reorganization is that it feels like it leaves the origin section feeling just a little bit dull, like I was never able to hit any climaxes like I end up doing with DA2 and Inquisition portions of the series. So I can only hope that my analysis for the first game was worthwhile enough that you'll go on to watch the next video soon after this and hopefully get a good idea why I seem so intent on negging down the storyline of the first game. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful time and never end up losing your love for video games, so that one day we might end up running into each other once again. Thank you. Unlike many of the other nobles presented in the story, he even seems- Whoa, no, that's not good, that's not- Unlike men- Oh, no, no, no. Jin has thrown you into. Also found it. What? What? can result in 300 to 500 percent increases in power from only Ew. ironically the steel siege probably should have been Ew. 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 oh nope okay so you buy a golem control rod off a random merchant no. No, 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 no! Test, test, test. One, two, three. What am I gonna lose in this audio? Yes, yes, yes. Cause you play sucks. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Jawain, 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 Mac Tierlogain, Jawain, Jawain. The drunken dwarf. The stoic zoic. So after liver. But after retrieving all your stuff and moody, yeah. 
At this point, I ended up tracking down the last known location of a warden who was hunting Grace. Wow, that's not right. But the actual explanation is that they're just a rare bleat. Mm. I'm not sure I understand how the st uh, no. As a self-righteous hor- eh. Orc Slayer. God, I hate myself. Since he had attempted to give the old god Earth Thermiel. Eh. Nope. Nope. That's a rewrite.